Seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Nineteen, twenty, twenty one. Twenty two, twenty three, twenty four. Twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven. Twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty. Thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. Test one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. 
Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Call this meeting of the Board of Supervisors of November 5th, 2013 to order. Roll call, please. Supervisor Bronson. <coughs> Supervisor Carroll. Here. Supervisor Elias. Present. Supervisor Miller. Here. Chairman Valadez. Present. Let the record show all members are present. Uh, is Pastor Sal Perez here? All right, I don't think he's here, so we'll probably just do a moment of silence, which will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Supervisor Carroll. Everyone, please stand for a moment of silence. Supervisor Carroll has a point of personal privilege. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Valadez. It's appropriate this morning that I remember the life of Jack Arnold, the judge who was buried yesterday out of St. Peter and Paul Catholic Church. <coughs> judge Arnold served on the Pima County Superior Court bench. He was also very active in his particular faith, being a member of Many organizations as the Knights of Columbus and the Father Junipero Serra League. He left uh, a widow, Dorothy, and eight children and 17 grandchildren who were present yesterday in what I thought was a very beautiful and moving service as, as I said, St. Peter and Paul Catholic Church. Uh, there was the bishop and a litany uh, and of uh, public officials and court officials that I just appreciate being there and I want to thank the clerk of the Superior Court, Tony Helen, this morning for allowing them to be uh, at this service while court business was being handled by her office. Uh, thank you very much and I just want to say again he was a, a, a role model for all public servants and a wonderful man with a wonderful family. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gill. Mr. Chairman. May I have a point of personal privilege, please? Please proceed, Supervisor Miller. Um, I would like to uh, uh, just say thank you to uh, Boeing 
Uh, yesterday, they donated, many of you may have read about this in the paper, may not even know about it. They donated a 737 aircraft to the Pima Air and Space Museum, and I had the honor of attending there yesterday. And it's just an amazing facility to visit, and um, I also uh, got to see the aircraft and brought the picture, the one of my father-in-law flew, the B-26, he just passed away recently. And it was an amazing uh, event to be able to go and stand in front of that aircraft and have my picture taken in front of the aircraft, along with the picture of my father-in-law flying over the Zyder Z in World War II. It was uh, a fascinating event, and it was wonderful to be a part of it. And if you have an opportunity, please go visit the uh, Pima Air and Space Museum. It is a, an amazing facility and a real tribute not only to our military, but also to the aerospace industry, the commercial aerospace industry, which I used to work in as well. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Miller. Anyone else? <clears throat> Hearing none, we'll go ahead and move to pause for pause. Today we have Officer Bowden, who is here with Osborne, a red-colored German Shepherd pit bull mix of seven years. Good morning. Um, this is Osborne, and Osborne was quite pleased to see that he's got quite a lot of his friends here today, which is really, really nice to see. Um, Osborne is, is about, <laughs> he's pleading his case. <laughs> he's about seven years old, which is quite a mature dog. <laughs> Difficult to get out, uh, the older dogs okay, adopted sometimes, and he adopted. seems to be having that trouble. Um, He's a great dog, very well-mannered, very sweet, and um, not a mean bone in his body. Uh, he's, he's got a lot of good years left in him. Uh, he just needs a home. He's been waiting with us since July 25th of this year. So if you can imagine, <laughs> he's a sucker for the camera, too. <laughs> uh, very popular dog, especially with the volunteers, but so many of our volunteers have already taken in as many animals as they can squeeze into their homes comfortably. So unfortunately, he hasn't found success even with uh, one of us down at the shelter to take him home. He, he needs a home um, with somebody out in the community, and he needs to get out there as quick as possible. We've had him, like I said, since July. He's received, you know, the best care that he could get, uh, lots of attention. He gets walked every day by some of these fantastic people. Uh, he gets treats, he gets love, attention, all that stuff. But every night he does have to live in a shelter and be a homeless dog. He doesn't have a home of his own. Uh, he's, his adoption rate is reduced because he is elderly and he does have a little bit of a dental need. Um, we do have one of our rescue organizations that have offered to sponsor and assist with any dental work that he may need. Um, so the expense of taking on an older dog isn't necessarily going to mean that you're going to have enormous vet bills. Uh, he does need some dental care, but like I said, it's, it's, it's not terribly outrageous from what I understand, and he does have a little bit of a fund uh, ready for him. Beyond that, a $15 licensing fee, and you've got yourself a nice dog. He's 50 pounds, and he will be neutered, microchipped, and has, have his first round of shots before he goes. And we have uh, an enormous amount of very educated and, and uh, informed volunteers that if you have any training issues, that you can always come to them, and they'll do their best to help you out. Um, but he's just looking for a home. We've held on to him for quite some time. And uh, I'd like to get him out as quick as possible. I hate to see him spend the holiday season with us after having his entire summer basically spent waiting for a home. So. Like so many of our other pets, which if this isn't the dog for you, but you're looking for a dog or a cat, we've got so very, very many. Um, we have lots of animals. Our animals, contrary to the unfortunate uh, reputation that a lot of shelters have, we don't just kill them if there is no place for them. We have plenty of people willing to take them in, rescue groups. There is no deadline when an animal comes in, as may have been the case in some communities in the past. Dogs aren't marked with a number of this many days, and then if you're not adopted, it's, you're done. We go the distance for these dogs, and we keep them for as long as it takes, and we do whatever we can to help get them some homes. All these folks out up front, they know, they know this. These, these are part of, the, part of the solution that we have going. Um, as you're aware, we are short on space, though. Um, we wouldn't be able to keep all these animals if we didn't have the space for them. And we, we fortunately are, are getting by right now, but it's a, it's a growing problem. 
And until, as a community, we can solve the problem of this pet overpopulation situation, we really do need to take care of those that are here. So this, this one, we'll hold on to them for as long as we need to, but we would like to get them as home, in a home as quickly as possible. So if you or anyone you know is looking for a dog, kind of looks like this guy. <laughs> He's the one for you. We're open from 12 until 7 on weekdays, 10 to 5 on weekends. And there's lots and lots of cats as well if you're not into dogs. So, And if you are interested in helping out, we always welcome volunteers. You can go to our website. On our website, you can both uh, check into our volunteer information. And if you want to help out financially, we take donations online as well. So please, uh, if, there, if you can't help out by taking one into your home, maybe there's some other, other way you can help out. And I, and I believe it was uh, Mahatma Gandhi that had said, the greatness of a nation can be measured by how well its animals are treated. So please help us out and help us uh, get all these animals into the homes that they deserve. And in the meantime, we will fill in the gaps and, and, and take care, all of us together, to make sure that these animals are cared for until they do find that forever home. So thank you for your time. And, and thank you so much for letting us bring a dog here every time you have a meeting. It's, they all get adopted once they come, <laughs> come down here. So, so hopefully this one will carry on that tradition. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman. Osborne seems like a bit of a theatrical dog, don't you think, uh, <laughs> Supervisor Elias? You know, I, I was thinking he is kind of a theatrical <laughs> dog, and and you know uh, we could call him a Black Sabbath dog since his name is Osborne. Supervisor <laughs> Miller said he's Ozzy, Ozzy Osborne. So, um, you know that might help in the adoption process. But I was thinking that because you brought that up about him being a theatrical dog, that uh, maybe our teacher of the year would like to uh, oh. sponsor this dog <laughs> and. Um, Absolutely. All right, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Onkus. So uh, we got a free dog here for anybody who wants to go home with a Black Sabbath dog and, you know, play that song Paranoid at really loud volume, you know. Mr. Chairman. So where's the girl? Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Officer Bowden, that was a very passionate and well, well said presentation for Pause for Pause this morning. Thank you. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask all those volunteers that are here this morning to please stand and be recognized for the great effort that you do. Thank you. And I, I'm sure I speak for uh, the dog who I brought home a couple weeks ago named Hamilton, if you recall, a little matted up schnauzer who lived there for a few weeks. He sends his very best. <laughs> he went from the doghouse to the penthouse. He had uh, cooked chicken last night for dinner, and uh, for this morning he had salmon leftovers. <laughs> so there is hope. Keep up the good work. I love all of you. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Thank you, Officer Ben. Mr. Chairman, I, I would note that I think that's also the first time <coughs> um, We've had uh, Mahatma Gandhi quoted during Pause for Pause. I just wanted to take a second to note that because uh, I found it to be very profound and, uh, and, and really an appropriate thing to do because it, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. There are several changes to the agenda. On the regular agenda, page two, item seven, executive session, unfinished business. Staff requests this item be removed from the agenda. Consent calendar. Page 11, item 7, contract and award information technology correction to the uh, agenda item. It uh, currently reads um, P, uh, City of Tucson Amendment Number 13 to provide for the PC Win Site Specific Agreement City of Tucson Public Safety Training Academy. Public Safety Training Academy should read Tumamak Sublease. Uh, page 12, item number 14, contract and award, Sheriff, Bureau of Land Management, staff request this item be removed from the agenda. And page 14, item number 32, real property, application to amend lease, correction to the total acreage uh, reduction. It uh, indicates 30 acres and it's 13 acres. So without uh, objection, those will be the uh, changes to the agenda. Uh, I believe we have uh, two uh, proclamations, the first of which will be item number five on the regular agenda, COPD Awareness Month. Supervisor? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll move the item. Yeah. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Supervisor Bronson, if you could please and do the And is Jim Nelson here? 
Oh, we're, oh, there you guys are. Okay. Proclamation, whereas chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, also known as chronic bronchitis and emphysema, is the third leading cause of death in the United States and is the only one of the top five causes of death whose prevalence and death rate is rising. And whereas chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a <coughs> chronic and progressive disease that affects over 30 million individuals in the U.S., half of whom have not been properly diagnosed, and whereas a diagnostic test for COPD known as spirometry is available for use, allowing early diagnosis, yet many patients suffering with COPD are not diagnosed until they have reached an advanced stage, and whereas the major risk factor for COPD is smoking, other risk factors include environmental exposure to air pollution, industrial irritants, and burned biomass fuels, and whereas COPD can also result from genetic conditions such as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and whereas COPD is considered to be the second leading cause of disability in the nation, whereas the annual cost to the nation in 2013 is estimated to be over $50 billion, and whereas increased public awareness, early detection and treatment are crucial in the prevention or slowing the progression of lung disease and can lead to reduced costs and better quality of life for our residents. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pima County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims the month of November 2013 to be COP Awareness Month throughout the county and encourages all residents of Pima County to learn more about the prevention and treatment of COPD, passed and adopted this fifth day of November. And Jim, I just recently lost my husband to COPD, and so I really understand the importance of this, but perhaps you'd like to say a few words. Thank you so much for the, to the board for this recognition. Um, Proclamations are, can be kind of a dime a dozen, you know, it's National Asparagus Month or it's whatever. Um, COPD is, one of the problems with it is awareness, and this is why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we're not standing here looking like great pumpkins just for the heck of it. It's, it's uh, orange is the color of COPD, awareness. Uh, Mary and I represent the state of Arizona with the National COPD Foundation. We are also uh, the Arizona representatives for the COPD Coalition of the American Lung Association. Um, I was diagnosed with severe COPD at the age of 55, which was a few years ago now. I had quit smoking at age 35 and thought, well, I dodged that bullet. Wrong. One of the problems with COPD is the fact that it takes so many years to manifest itself. It's a, it's a progressive disease, it's chronic, it does not go away. Sharon can verify this. It took 20 years from the time I quit smoking until my symptoms got bad enough. Shortness of breath, coughing, excess mucus, this type of thing. Uh, drove me to a hospital with double pneumonia and my diagnosis. 17 years later, um, at St. Joe's Hospital in Phoenix, it'll be two years ago now in December, I had a double lung transplant. Had it not been for that, I wouldn't be standing here today. There's not a question in my mind. So it's, we're, we're, we're doing whatever we can. Uh, things like this. Uh, really help because it makes people aware. Um, probably 80% of COPD patients um, are that way because of cigarette smoking. Some are not. There are genetic factors. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is all you really need to know 
but it's a genetic deficiency that makes you more susceptible to COPD. Uh, but whatever the factors are, it is a very slow-growing disease. It's very easy to blame your shortness of breath, your inability to do things you used to enjoy on growing older, being out of shape, being overweight, this type of thing. So thank you so much. Uh, this, this is one more step in and our... I think um, it's really important that we do the wellness tests to get that test. That Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's something called a pulmonary function test, which consists of blowing into a little machine it tests your lung capacity, and it'll tell your physician, your pulmonologist, um, whether you have COPD, first of all, or whether it's asthma or something else, allergies, and if you do, uh, what stage you are in, how, how far along you are in the process. Um, there are a lot of things that can be done about it, um, but it is progressive, and it's not going to go away. So. We all need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of it for ourselves, our children, our family members, whatever. So again, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for this. Thank you, Jim. No, I thank, you. thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move uh, to the... Uh, Presentation proclamation on the addendum agenda item number one, Art Almquist Day. Second. Motion and second to approve the item. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. I have, I'm going to ask Supervisor Elias. Mr. Almquist, would you and your family please come up? I still think you, you uh, that ought to be your mascot. I mean, Ozzy, how could you how could you not? We're gonna make you hold this, Art. And uh, first things first, you know, we have this great proclamation for our National Teacher of the Year, great guy, Art Onkel. Give him a round of applause, please. What an honor! But also, his mommy is one of the Doñas del Presidio de Tucson. So we have to give it up for her, too, absolutely. Gracias, Doña. Thank you for being here with us today. It means a lot to me personally, as, as well as to everyone here in our community. I've been told to repeat the words Tucson High a number of times during this morning's uh, um, presentation to um, Mr. Onquist. And, and don't forget his wife, of course, but I was going to get to that. Sorry, give sorry. me a minute. Uh, but uh, Tucson High came, you know, in District 5. Um, is very proud of uh, Tucson Unified School District's flagship high school and uh, we're proud of all the success that they've had and of course we're especially happy to have his beautiful wife with us here today so yeah. we'll bring you over here to stand by me because that makes me look better and I'm going to read this proclamation now and uh, again thank Art for everything he's given to our students and, and um, to our community because that's how we develop the social fabric Let's be honest, it's with great teachers, people who care, people who influence others, people who make a difference. And maybe there's no better way to make a difference than through, through drama and through um, theatrics and, and being a true thespian. Uh, I think that's an important part of all of this. And that's not just because I'm a drama queen, uh, although I am. Um, I better read this now, huh? No, no, it's, 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 read I'll, the mm. proclamation, Richard. <laughs> Did I say Tucson High enough times? You know, I, I have to mention Tucson High again because there's one person in the audience who's demanded that I repeat Tucson High over and over and over again. Um, whereas, Tucson native Art Omquist is a devotee of drama and equally dedicated to teaching the subject at Tucson High Magnet School. Whereas Art Omquist has for 17 years used his teaching of drama to help Tucson High students discover who they are and that they have the ability in many and varied ways to be meaningful parts of the larger society. And whereas Art Omquist empowers students in his drama classes to trust themselves as unique individuals who nonetheless share commonalities with others as they see parts of themselves in the characters they play. And whereas the students in Art Onquist's class learn that drama is part of the human life 
and a means of communicating the stories that everyone has to tell. And whereas Aranquist's ability to successfully teach drama is enhanced by his own experience on the stage as he has worked locally with his wife Amy and with the Invisible Theater, Live Theater Workshop, and Beowulf Alley Theater Company, and whereas the teaching career of Art Unquist is based on a solid educational background as he has a bachelor's degree from Vassar College in theater education and master's degrees from the University of Montana in acting and in performance theory and criticism. Whereas the application of Art Almquist for 2013 Teacher of the Year recognition from People Magazine made him a finalist for the magazine's People Choice Award, and whereas so many of Art Onquist's friends, associates, and admiring students voted for him that he won this coveted national award. Now therefore be it resolved that the Pima County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaim Tuesday, November 5th, 2013 to be Art Onquist Day to recognize him for this accomplishment and to honor him for his many years of outstanding service to Tucson High students, <laughs> guiding them towards successful futures. Pass and adopted this fifth day of November, 2013. Let's all give them one more nice round of applause. Oh man! Oh yeah! Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I feel like this is my Oscar speech. Um, and I'm going to get played off in a second. But, um, but thank you so much um, to the City Council, Board of, Board of Supervisors, my apologies. <laughs> in spite of being a teacher, I'm not very bright. Um, but uh, a big thank you, um, and uh, a thank you to everyone at Tucson High who supported me in, in all of this. Um, and I want to thank, obviously, my family. Um, and uh, just a word for everybody, I am a Tucson native, uh, a product of Arizona Public Schools, and I want to ask everybody here to please support our public schools. Uh, they're under fire right now. Lots of people would like to see them just go away, and um, we can't let that happen. We just cannot. Our students are too important, um, and the students that I work with, I work literally with students who are homeless and have no opportunities, and coming to school in the morning is what gives them those opportunities. So in, oh. So uh, just in the future, um, when you're voting, when you're offering support to people, keep our public schools in mind. Um, we really, really matter. The students really matter, and everything we're trying to do um, matters. Arizona, as we probably know, is one of the lowest states in the country in terms of per student spending. We got to change that. Uh, my friend, the art teacher, started the school year this year with no paint. Um, and that's just a literal kind of put it in our, our faces of what's going on out there. So um, that's my little speech. I'll get off my soapbox. I want to thank everybody here today. Um, and again, thank you very, very much for this wonderful, wonderful honor. Thank you. No, you didn't. Uh, Chair, on the motion to go into executive session. So moved. Is there a second? second? Motion and second to go into executive session. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. We will return the sound of the gavel, uh, which should be relatively shortly.
Call this meeting back to order. There was one item in the executive session calendar. Council, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, executive session item eight on the regular agenda concerns Hub Properties Trust versus Pima County Superior Court case number C, 2013 uh, 0002 in the Arizona Tax Court. This, this case involves a challenge to the valuation of a 23-story high-rise building consisting of approximately uh, 285,521 square feet located at 1 South Church Avenue and two associated parcels. The proposed settlement redu would reduce the full cash value uh, of that of the largest parcel with the, with the uh, high-rise from $25,800,000 to $22,800,000. The Pima County Attorney's Office and the, county and the Assessor's Office recommend the proposed settlement, which would result in a total tax decrease of $93,534.49 for the tax year. Uh, <coughs> the values at issue here will not roll over to 2014, nor will the uh, legal classification and assessment ratio be changed. Move the county attorney and assessor's recommendation. Second. Motion and, sec and a second to approve the county assessor and attorney's recommendation. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. I will go ahead and uh, here the, uh, will be the order of the, uh, the items. I will move to addendum item number seven, which will be followed by addendum item number four, and then we will proceed with the regular uh, agenda items. So having said that, I'm going to go ahead and move to addendum item number seven, the AECOM Technical Services Incorporated. Ms. Solicobert, do you have any comments on that one? Mr. Chairman, this is an amendment, I think <laughs> amendment number nine to the design of the courts building uh, necessitated by a number of actions including the necessary design of the floors that were formerly occupied by the city of Tucson and now occupied or going to be occupied by the treasurer, recorder, and assessor. Mr. Chairman, um, I'd, be, I'd be, well, uh, for purposes of discussion, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and second. So Mr. Chairman. Well, yeah, I would like to, uh, if we could, Mr. Huckleberry, get a report from you. Um, what this is actually costing us, and this is another half a million dollars into a court complex, and what what has it cost us since the city of Tucson failed to meet their commitment? Um, what other additional costs are out there? Um, I'd certainly like to see a report um, just uh, summarizing what the cost of this downtown court complex is at this point in time. Mr. Alcabay? Uh Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Bronson, we can provide that detail. I think we, we have it in... Uh, a number of binders and, and uh, documents and it can be assembled fairly quickly by the facilities management director and I can forward it to the entire board for your information. Thank you. Ms. Miller. Mr. Chairman, um, I have a question on this also regarding the same um, thing. The other thing that I would like to talk about is the fact that we've allocated monies out of the general fund, uh, 22 million and I think more than that. I didn't get an opportunity to go back, but I got a report from Mr. Burke this morning that shows that there's almost $6 million still remaining in this bond fund after we pulled money out of the general fund several times. So this is very concerning to me that we're uh, using general fund money when we still have bond fund money left for this item. And, um, you know, even though the city of Tucson pulled out, it's curious to me that we're using general fund money when we still have bond money left from 2004. Thank you. Mr. Ogilberry. Uh Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, we are using the about $22.4 million that was allocated from the general fund into the tax rate stabilization fund. And it was allocated at the time the board had in entered into the shell contract uh, for the facility, which is $48 million. Uh, we then have been drawing down the bond funds uh, over time uh, and um, we, as I think um, Mr. Burke indicated, there's, we're still drawing down those bond funds. We will soon probably uh, expend all of them and they get drawn down uh, sporadically from time to time simply because in some cases the, the funding is in the next sale of bonds 
and so what we're doing is cash flowing uh, the obligations in the contract with the general fund. So we can, if there's more information you'd like, we can provide the cash flow analysis from which fund uh, that uh, is needed to meet the obligations that are currently under contract. Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to know this f uh, half of uh, $530,000, is this the final amount it's going to take to get these folks moved in? Or is there going to be additional uh, contract monies that will be allocated? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Miller, this should be the final design because even in this change order, there's construction management services that are included. Um, but once we you know, get the final design, there's going to be uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment costs associated with moving the, the uh, departments into the building. And do we have bond monies for those, or are those going to be coming out of the general fund, or is that going to be down the road? Yeah, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Miller, those will be coming out of the bond funds. By that time, we will certainly have exhausted any bond funds that would remain, and they will come from a certificate of participation uh, issuance that was uh, budgeted this year, I think approximately $58 million, uh, to finish all of the internal work and the parking garage as well as the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So that will come out, and obviously, certificates of participation are repaid with general fund appropriations. Mm -hmm. And, I, <coughs> excuse me, I do recognize that it, it was the result of the city of Tucson um, pulling out of this contract that has left it on the back <coughs> of the county. And um, so I thank you for your answers. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Mm, Mr. Chairman? Supervisor Elias. Um, Mr. Huckleberry, when you, when you uh, complete that uh, memo that uh, Supervisor Bronson requested, please add in the, the cash flow analysis that you spoke of in your mm -hmm. response to sure. Supervisor Miller, because I think it's important for the public to know that uh, we're managing our cash carefully and, and correctly on a project of this dimension and scope, uh, and uh, it's important that that be put down in writing somewhere, so we have that as well just all in one place so that it's easy for folks to find. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kill. I'd just like to dovetail on uh, what Mr. Elias said. If you could put a, a note in there, if it's Mr. Burke or Mr. Huckleberry, to explain to the board members uh, the policies that uh, we've put in for dealing uh, with the arbitrage issue of the, of the county's bond package and priorities uh, and phases are, uh, if it would be helpful. Uh, to be delineated as far as the completion of this project, including your COP uh, prospective um, funding sources later on in the project. But thank you. I look forward to uh, getting the report that Supervisor Bronson has asked for, and I appreciate call the question. Question has been called on item number seven. Uh, motion before us is on the approval of item number seven. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please <laughs> signify by saying nay. Eyes have it. Moving on to item number four on the addendum agenda, which is the expanding uh, shelter facilities at Pima Animal uh, Care Center. Mr. Huckleberry. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, it was um, about uh, several, I think, weeks ago that um, at a Pima County Animal Care Advisory Committee, there was standing room only. A lot of concern expressed with regard to uh, the overcrowding of uh, animals at the facility. Um, the county has uh, endeavored over, we'll say, the last few years to try and uh, reduce the number of euthanasias that occur at the facility. And uh, what the, that means is that when we have a cycle of, uh, of animals that are coming into the facility, uh, they have to be housed uh, longer periods in order to reduce the euthanasia rates. We are having, in some cases, um, uh, animals housed uh, forward of the kennel, which is not um, either healthy nor uh, conducive to operations of the facility, as well as uh, getting animals adopted from the facility. And so, therefore, uh, staff came to me with a great deal of concern about what was occurring and that we had to do something. We either had to increase euthanasia or increase uh, capacity at the shelter. What I have before you is kind of an emergency action to increase capacity at the shelter. 
um, we have uh, since uh, the last uh, probably week and a half or two weeks uh, gone out and, and uh, secured uh, contractors under what we call the job order contracting uh, components that we have in place uh, and have actually located a, a tent facility that can be purchased out of California and transmitted fairly quickly. And so what we're really interested in is providing additional capacity. Uh, this particular action uh, could increase, and I say could, would increase uh, shelter capacity by 50% uh, and has the capability, uh, should we add more kennels, to increase it by almost 100%. Um, we think that's a prudent course of action. It is unbudgeted, and therefore, obviously, I need the board's authorization from contingency uh, to make these expenditures. Uh, in addition, um, we have been continuing and redoubling our efforts uh, through the help of a lot of folks, including the volunteers, uh, with regard to uh, the long-term answer to this issue is increasing uh, the spay-neuter program. And um, we have uh, had a, a recent, uh, what I call, success in that particular program. Uh, Oro Valley has uh, voluntarily joined the county in providing their differential fees to put into the spay-neuter program. So long-term solution is really spay-neuter, uh, increased funding, but that's not going to happen overnight. And therefore, the only option we have is to expand shelter capacity. And this particular proposal does that. Uh, it will be expended this year because we would hope to have these facilities up and operational uh, within just a few months and staffed uh, accordingly. Uh, and then it will then become an expense that rolls into the budget for animal care next year. And that expense is then reapportioned back out to all participating jurisdictions. So in the final analysis, we'll have to ultimately pay the county, and our component cost of this is about 50%. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the item for discussion. Second. Motion and second. Uh, any questions or comments? Um, so where's Miller? My comments are first, uh, I would like to thank this board and previous members for um, doing the outreach that you do every week that has been done every week here at the Board of Supervisors with a pause for cause. I think it's a wonderful uh, thing that has been done that gets makes people aware of what is going on with the uh, animal shelter and also Officer Bowden and the staff out there for all the hard work they do. For all of the volunteers, uh, I know how difficult this has got to be for you um, to be out there with these animals that don't have homes. And it's a very difficult situation that we're in. Um, I would like to see, you know, um, you know, I think it's, it, I want to thank Oro Valley for stepping up and I'd like to see other communities do the same and see more outreach to try to, and, and I don't know, I would like to ask Mr. Huckleberry, do we have a long-term plan to um, try to expand the spay-neuter program? I know everything takes money and I know right now we've got some money from Oro Valley, but if we have a program that we're going to be moving forward with. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Miller, we're looking at three options at the moment. Obviously, the one that we tried to do is to convince jurisdictions to participate voluntarily, much the way the county did initially. And uh, we think that perhaps with uh, Oro Valley's um, um, entry into that voluntary contribution, we'll now have a reason to reapproach, which we will, Sarita, Marana, and the city of Tucson, as well as South Tucson and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to convince them. Absent being able to convince them, uh, I've asked the county attorney for um, their options with regard to could the county in fact impose, and this is, again, we don't want to do this, but we look at, at options. Could we impose a $3 animal welfare fee for every license in Pima County and dedicate that money to spay and neuter? So then we can basically increase the spay and neuter program uh, in financing from it's about two hundred and twenty to two hundred and forty thousand dollars now to perhaps as much as six hundred to six hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. The third option is simply to and we haven't done this before and, and again it's one of the options we'll look at and obviously the final choice is and, and the option is going to come to the board uh, particularly you know the second option is going to require board action. Third option is whether or not we just simply say that spay neuter should become an operational expense of the operating the animal care center. 
and if we say it's because if we make the decision that it's an operating expense <coughs> then we can place a budget item the number that we would select would probably be about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the budget and because it's then as an operating expense it gets apportioned back to the jurisdictions automatically uh, so we're looking at those three options and um, hopefully the voluntary one will work because we think with the voluntary action, it actually helps improve the communication and education of the public with regard to the necessity of, of spay neuter. Um, but if that one doesn't work, we're going to look at option two and finally option three. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So where's the girl, Mr. Huckleberry? I think it's clearly identified as the root of the problem is. Uh, spay and neuter is not being done in a voluntary way even if funding is available to allow that to happen for some families. Uh, we've seen other communities have political discourse on the idea of mandatory spay and neuter. Uh, can you give us any input on that? It's obvious that pay us now or pay us later issue if you're talking about getting to the root of the problem. Uh, I know it's enforceable. It's sometimes uh, a police harassment tool. In other communities, it's been voted down for being called such. But what are the possibilities because of these other jurisdictions not being willing to uh, be part of a, ma a, a plan that would, in fact, uh, imp increase the likelihood of a reduction of animals in our pound or our ca animal care center? Uh, what's your thoughts on mandatory spay neuter? Uh, where has it been done successfully and what were the results in financial <coughs> figures? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Carroll, um, I, you, you, we're in the process of doing a 10 community survey, uh, actually I think requested by the advisory committee and the volunteers, that talks about what other communities do, what other communities of similar size. That, that study is, is uh, probably about two to three weeks away from being completed. Um, and I'm do I don't know if we've asked mandatory versus voluntary spay neuter questions and we can do that because I frankly don't know enough about the outcomes of mandatory uh, programs to make a judgment at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Mis Mr. Chairman, a follow up to that. If we were to proceed in that, um, assuming we would proceed with some sort of mandatory program, it would only apply to unincorporated Pima County. We would not have any authority over the jurisdictions. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Bronson, we may not even have the authority ourselves. And so again, we may, we may, well, we may have to ask the legislature because I don't think we can adopt a mandatory uh, program without authority f to do so and uh, my guess is that that may be an uh, amendment to state law. Okay, thank you. So where's the list? Mr. Chairman, um, now I I'm anxious to hear our speakers because we have so much interest in this subject from a number of different perspectives and I think that's important. Um, this is an important step but it's really not satisfactory at all. We have to be honest with ourselves. This is not a satisfactory solution. This is an emergency solution to try and give animals a better chance to survive the ordeal at animal care. That's what it is. But we should have no illusions about this being a satisfactory answer to the situation that we face. And it needs to be a springboard for a more important discussion about uh, how we're going to improve animal care in the future. And that means uh, making sure that it becomes a part of our bond projects. That also means that we might even have to look at other emergency measures between now and then because we don't know how successful this is going to be or how our animals are going to be in the heat of the summer. Um, that's an important issue for all of us. Again, anxious to hear from um, our constituents that are here today. I think that's important and I want to hear a number of different perspectives. Um, on this whole issue from spay and neuter to this emergency situation to no kill to a whole bunch of different ideas that we have out there. We're open to many answers and many things but I think we need to be open and honest and have a, a forthright discussion about what a difficult issue this is. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments from the board? 
If not, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call up speakers. I would please ask you to, if a uh, previous speaker has made uh, the points that you have made, please make uh, new points or, uh, or otherwise uh, you will have three minutes to speak. Um, let me call first on Barbara Mayer. Please come up, identify yourself for the record, and you have three minutes. Yes. Good morning, honorable supervisors, uh, staff, and members of the public. My name is Barbara Mayer. I reside at 4026 North Star Park Place. Uh, my zip code is 85716. Uh, I've lived in Tucson most of my life. I went to school here at the U of A. Um, I'm a cardiac nurse at UA Medical Center. Uh, my family owns a restaurant here uh, in Tucson over 30 years. And uh, my son, who went away to school, came back to Tucson to be an engineer at Raytheon. Uh, so strong ties to our community. Uh, we feel very fortunate for everything that Tucson has given our family. So we try to give back when we can. So that's why I'm a volunteer at PAC. Uh, I chose to volunteer uh, at PAC, even though I live just a few minutes away from the Humane Society. Uh, the first big reason is, uh, one of the big reasons is, uh, this, this is Lucy. And uh, Lucy and I, uh, my husband and I adopted Lucy from PAC, an off-site adoption event four years ago. At that time, she was $40, she was spayed, she was vaccinated, she was microchipped, and licensed. Uh, she did have kennel cough, but it was easily treated with a uh, round of antibiotics. Her first visit with her vet was uh, waived because she was from PAC. Uh, she is our best friend. The other big reason is uh, this. And <clears throat> you can see there are five dogs here in this kennel. PAC desperately needs uh, help. They are overwhelmed with the number of homeless pets in Tucson. Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but there were there are five dogs in here. Uh, the ironic thing is the little guy here in the middle uh, was taken to pack by his former owner because he didn't get along with other dogs. <laughs> just, just a side note. Uh, <clears throat> my job uh, at PAC is to walk dogs, but as you can imagine, uh, it can be a challenge to take one of these dogs uh, out of the kennel uh, a very crowded kennel uh, because all the other dogs want to come out at the same time. <clears throat> it can be heartbreaking, but I try my best and stay positive, especially when I see a small handful of employees who are trying their best to, to take care of uh, all the hundreds of homeless animals every day. Also, I've been impressed by uh, the awesome inmate program that I, I didn't even know existed until I, until I started volunteering at PAC. Um, and, of course, uh, the great volunteer program that's in place and seems to be growing every week. Um, uh, think of all the great dogs that work for our community. Police dogs, border patrol, service dogs for the disabled, uh, comfort dogs that come to visit our pediatric patients in the hospital. This is, this is going to sound a little silly, but if we were able to ask them, would you be willing, they don't get a paycheck, but would you be willing to contribute some of your kibbles to our homeless pets, I know in my heart that they would say yes. Um, I feel that my time and my, my hard-earned tax dollars are well spent at PAC. I'm hopeful that the rest of the Tucson community will agree and understand that there's a critical need for more shelter for these homeless pets. Um, I want to thank you for your time, and I also really want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service to our community. Very important. Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Any questions for me? So, Mr. Carroll? Mr. Chairman. We try to support local and uh, to tell us the name of your family restaurant. <laughs> okay. Uh, Silver Saddle Steakhouse. <laughs> Love the Silver Saddle. Thank <laughs> you very much. Just had lunch there last week. Thank you for and what you're doing. First time coming to one of these, and I, I was really impressed. And I have teachers in my family, so hearing the, the Teacher of the Year here in Tucson, and uh, you know, I take care of patients with COPD, so it was really, uh, really great experience for me. So glad you're here. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to call No Mayoti. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Uh, 
honorable supervisors, uh, fellow citizens, and fellow volunteers. Uh, my name is Noe Mayotte, and I live on Four Barrel Court here in Tucson. Uh, I'm not here this morning merely in support of the proposed allocation of funds that will help expand the capacity of Pima Animal Care Center. We all know there are serious overcrowded conditions at the shelter. Uh, we're currently housing over 400 dogs. Many of them are forced to share a four by eight container, and these are large dogs. Uh, it was indicated by the previous speaker, when you try to get a dog out to show it or to walk it, it is a challenge, especially some of these 60, 70 pound dogs. And the, the smaller, uh, more petite, politically correct work, uh, the more petite volunteers really have a problem and, and we have dogs escaping and, and they also tend to be aggressive in s such confined areas. So I'd like to go on and say that many of the constituents who come before you are requesting funding for projects that they believe are important and I'm sure they are. Uh, I won't be doing that today. It's, it's obvious that the recent bond allocation vote uh, by the public has shown overwhelming support of investing in needed improvements at the animal shelter. What I'd like to do at this time is share some figures with you. There are currently approximately 500 citizens of Pima County who are volunteering at PAC. They come in every morning at the crack of dawn, helping to walk the dogs, making sure the animals get a daily dose of exercise and socialization, fresh air, etc. Other volunteers are on hand during the open business hours at the shelter, greeting the public and facilitating the adoption process of introducing the adopters to the available animals. Answering their questions, helping them fill out paperwork, and in many cases, uh, chipping the animals so they can go home. So far this year, 7,500 animals have been adopted out to good homes in the area. Without these volunteers, the shelter staff would need to be greatly expanded to provide these basic services to the public. As an example, during the past 10 months, and that's January to October, the volunteers have logged in about 20,000 hours supporting the shelter staff at PACC. If you were to just apply a, a simple figure, monetary figure of $12 an hour to these uh, citizens that are providing the care to the community, you would be looking at approximately a quarter of a million dollars. And that doesn't include insurance or employee benefits. That would probably increase it by half again. Furthermore, many of the volunteers often spend their own money. They bring in treats for the dogs, leashes. Uh, they help sponsor uh, meet and greet events and regular organized community uh, dog walks invol involving people who <coughs> just like animals. Outside the shelter, these volunteers often serve as goodwill ambassadors within the community. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to ask you to summarize. You've already exceeded your three minutes. Excuse me? Please summarize. Summarize? Yes. Well, that's what I was about to do. Okay. That because we are visible in the community with our t-shirts, we are often uh, encouraging conversations about the good that Pima Animal Care is doing uh, the volunteers are doing within the community and Pima Animal Care is doing within the community. And that's all I wanted to say at the hundreds of dedicated volunteers appreciate the financial support of Pima County. Thank you. Any questions, comments? <laughs> Next, I'd like to call Cindy Curlin. Please come up, identify yourself for the record, you have three minutes. Good morning, honorable supervisors, members of the public and staff, and obviously all my friendly, friends, volunteers. I want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, my name is Cindy Curlin. I'm a Pima County resident. I live at 1800 North Rolling Stone Drive here in Tucson, and I'm a PAC volunteer, and I've been a PAC for four years now. As a PAC volunteer, I see daily people dropping off their animals, people coming in the door, intake, lining up to drop off an animal, or in many cases, multiple animals. This means that these folks have taken time out of their day to make sure that these animals are coming to a safe place. It might be a, a dog that's been loved all of its life, 
that the owner passed away, nobody to care for it. It might be their own family pet that they can't care for, maybe their circumstances in life have changed. It could just be a good Samaritan found a stray that wanted to get this dog or cat off the street to get it to a safe place and get it out of harm's way. So they bring it to PAC because it's called Pima Animal Care Center. It's a safe haven for our community homeless pets. But when they leave and you take and you move the dogs to the behind the doors or behind the other wall, it, the reality sets in. Due to the overcrowding, it's not a safe haven right now. The fights are constant. The stress is high. You have four and five dogs. If you're a little dog, you might be in with eight or nine dogs. Um, and you have dogs seriously getting injured or getting injured seriously because they're trying to eat their breakfast. Um, you also have older dogs, as we see in Osborne. You know, he's a senior dog. You have dogs that are um, very submissive. They couldn't defend themselves if they wanted to. So they'll back off their bowl of kibble to let their kennel mates have their food. And you don't even know that this is happening until three or four weeks later you see him huddled back in the corner <coughs> lost 10 or 15 pounds and just barely surviving because they've literally been starving to death. I mean, there's just no way to monitor that when it is so full. But keep in mind, this is not because PAC has bad dogs. They're not housing bad dogs. These are great dogs. These were good, happy, healthy dogs and cats coming in the door that aren't getting the proper care because of the limited staff and cramming them into the kennels. It's not to mention they're living in filth. I mean, when you have five dogs or nine little dogs in a kennel, there's nowhere for them to lay down. I mean, it's oftentimes we take them out for a walk, we have to give them a bath because they're covered in feces or urine. Um, in addition to that, to, just to, to add on, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. So I told myself I wasn't going to cry, but it's really hard not to cry. And, um, I, you know, I just want to appreciate, I appreciate all you guys have done to show past support for PAC. Um, but it's not enough. And I can tell you that even the stress in the kennels doesn't stop in the kennels. It rolls out to the volunteers. It rolls out to the limited staff. To break up these fights and to watch a beautiful dog be seriously injured to the point maybe they have to euthanize this dog because he was trying to eat his one bowl of kibbles in the morning, it's not right. So we, we count on you. We Please, we, we ask that you pass this um, to make it, to fix the emergency situation now for the overcrowding. But it's, it's not going to fix it long term. We've got a long way to go. But thank you so much for everything you've done thus far. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let me call on Mike Samitz. Please come up, identify yourself at the record, and you have three minutes. Good morning. My name is Mike Samitz. I reside here in Tucson. Unfortunately, I got a little misinformation. I planned for a five-minute speech, so I'm going to try to jam it into... But um, my name is Mike Samitz, and I am a PAC volunteer. And on behalf of myself and the many pets of PAC who have asked me to speak for them, we want to let you know that we are really looking forward to the more allocations of funds to help us out. My wife and I are animal lovers and heard about the PAC volunteer program a few months back and we showed up for the next training sessions all ready to go. As cat people, we got our hearts set on working with the cats, but found out that was something we had to wait for, little bureaucracy thrown in there. However, the training session opened our eyes to what PAC was all about. We were hooked and have since joined the crusade, not only to walk the dogs, but to get the good word out and tell others about what PAC is doing for the community and for the animals. This isn't just a bunch of talk and ideas, it is something that over our short time as volunteers, we have seen its growth and its accomplishments. So our Sunday routine is as follows. We get up <clears> early to walk the dogs. I still do my best to do a few hours throughout the week, but we look forward to Sunday when we walk the dogs as a team. That would be my wife and I. What makes it even better is that I see other couples as well as families doing the same. What a great family event. Not only is it helping the animals, it's great exercise. Each lap around the lake, it's about a half a mile, so not only do we get to meet and walk with four dogs each, we get a two-mile walk. And let's not forget about the arm building that we get because the dogs think they're walking us. My, my best guess is that as the word gets out, that more and more people will find that this is a great way to help the community themselves and more importantly, the animals so de who desperately need it. One day, we might get to actually care for the cats. It's very easy to see that our four-legged friends greatly appreciate what we are doing. 
you can't but not see that when you leash them up, they are knowing they know they're going for a walk. Their tails are going at 80 miles an hour and their excitement is clearly visible. And for whatever time they can get out and be free of the other dogs is quality time and they let us know it. And over the past few months, I can see the absolute necessity for the volunteers and the service they provide PAC. Without them, life for the residents of PACs would be horrible. It really scares me to think what life was like for these animals prior to the volunteer program that is now in place. Every morning, a select few volunteers write out on the board what dogs need to be walked and which have not been walked the day before. And it is up to the other dog volunteers throughout the day to walk those dogs. But my heart saddens each day as I look at the board and certain dogs did not get walked. But the simple answer is obviously more volunteers. And thanks to Jose and his love and his passion for what he is doing, that is something that will probably happen in the very near future. The best way to make the lives of these unfortunate animals who have come under the care of PAC, the best chance to walk out the doors to a new home is to get the word out, not by costly advertising, but through the ripple effect of all the volunteers who are currently devoting and donating their time, in many cases, their own money. We are your best advertisers. The money can't buy. But in all honesty, improving the conditions of the facility and providing more staff would significantly improve the number of volunteers. I ask each of you to think about this for a minute. Our first impressions are often our guide. So let's make our first impression of PAC one of wow instead of oh my. As great as the volunteers are and the millions of dollars in services they provide the county, they cannot make up for understaffing. PAC truly needs additional staffing. Just as the need to increase the kennels to reduce overcrowding, there is an equal need to do the same with the staff and make it more efficient, more productive, and less stressful. So my wife and I, along with many of our furry friends at PAC, who could not be with us this morning, ask kindly that you continue your support for PAC and approve the programs it has put before you. One of the great things about what you do for PAC is that you can easily see and measure the results. Mr. Simmons, I apologize, but I'm going to have to ask you to, to, to summarize. I, I've got two sentences. PAC has come a long way, and it can go much further with your continued support. I would like to thank the board and their time in listening and ask that you continue to support us in whatever ways you can. Thank you. Thank you. Let me reiterate, please try and keep your, uh, your, your comments to about three minutes. Okay. Don't forget to plug those local businesses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next I'm going to call Jack Newman. Please come up, identify yourself for the record, and you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Jack Newman. I am a volunteer at PAC. I also am chairman of the uh, advisory committee for PAC. And I spoke to you once before about what, we're, what we've been doing. The issue is exactly what, what Supervisor Elias is talking about. We are in a crisis situation where we have animals now that are, and you've heard before, three, four, and five per kennel. What we're looking for by this type of uh, it, uh, opening up the, the kennels to having more kennels as far as the tent or whatever method we would use is to allow us some space to have other ma means of taking care of these things. There's a lot of avenues that we can take. There's, I mean, there's the no-kill group, which has an 11-point process. There's a number of other ways we can do things as well. The issue right now is how do we give ourselves some elbow room? How do we finally get those four and five dogs from hurting each other every single day? If you go there in the morning, you will see dog fights, dogs hurting each other. There's no need for that. Other communities have been able to take care of it. We are just as capable as those other communities are. This is just a, a measure to give us some space to take some other measures. For example, if you had a car dealership and you had 20 people walk in the door, as we do at PAC, that come in just in the adoption portion of it, and they want to buy cars, we have one or two adoption people that are there to take care of those 20. We lose the capability of adopting out the rest of those animals. There are ways that we could have either more adopters or we would have an increase in staff, almost like you would hear when you're at Walmart or wherever and they say all cashiers to the front. They would then move the staff to the front, take care of adopting these dogs. Dogs that are adopted don't take space. So that's just an example of many, many ways that we can be doing it that don't cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. I realize this does, 
and this will help us. But already there are many, many ideas in place to even expand and take care of some of the areas within PAC itself to separate some of those kennels with dividers and gates. So the volunteers here essentially are just the, the tip of the iceberg. Throughout the community, everybody's talking about this. We are on a roll as far as what people in this community want. They are seeing that these are the right things to do. They're seeing that PAC is as good as the Humane Society. It's just a much, much larger facility. And it brings in dogs that it cannot turn back. And I'm also looking at your 15 seconds. So with that, I hope that you would take that into consideration when we're looking right now to take this very first step to taking care of the issues at PAC. One second left. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Newman? I just want to say to Mr. Newman, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Newman. Appreciate your leadership there at the Animal Care Center. And I also know that you uh, have personally shed blood over there. I appreciate uh, <laughs> all the times you've broken up the fights and been part of the leadership as well. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to call Manise Villen. Please come up, identify yourself for the record, and you have three minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisors, Mr. Huckleberry, and my fellow volunteers, my name is Marcy Vellen. I'm here representing No Kill Pima County. We're a grassroots op, um, organization, excuse me, committed to um, ending any needless killing that happens in our shelter by implementing the No Kill um, model. This is a proven model that's currently employed in over 200 communities in our country now that shows you can save the saveable and um, reserve euthanasia for those that truly need euthanasia, the incurably suffering and um, those that are unrehabilitatable. We truly support and thank and applaud Pima County for um, addressing the problems at PAC. Um, by providing contingency resources and more space and increased staff, this definitely will um, res um, relieve the current overcrowding. We also celebrate the good work of the volunteers, the rescues um, organizations in this community, and the staff at PAC who are truly making a difference in the Save Right right now. They represent pieces of a comprehensive approach, which is what we support. We also have to acknowledge that space and staff alone will not guarantee that more lives are saved. If, if we, it will require a planful and comprehensive approach. Space will not bring the medical care to the thousands of animals with easily treatable medical conditions that go untreated and are destroyed each year. Space does not automatically increase adoption, though it will help. Um, it does not automatically increase owner retention, which is a significant contribution to the overcrowding. It doesn't increase owner return rates, and it doesn't reduce the extensive wait list right now for the uh, currently funded spay-neuter program. These are, I think everybody agrees, these are important pieces of a comprehensive plan to resolve our issues at PAC. More space and staff also, lastly, doesn't address the need for a trap-neuter return support for the feral cats who never get a chance to survive at the shelter. The no-kill model is a blueprint for addressing all of these shelter policies, procedures, programs, and services, which do, not, which do result in saving the savable and reserving euthanasia for those that truly need it. There's no pros and cons to saving lives, only challenges and rewards. We urge Pima County administrators, board, and the care center to explore the benefits of a comprehensive no-kill model. The benefits include large grants, opportunities, sponsorships, and fiscal saving over time. Most importantly, to get behind saving the savable, it's an idea with tremendous public support and whose time has come. As an organization and a collaborator in the community, we hope to work with you to make it a reality. For the past year, we've been working to raise awareness of the problem and show the private citizens their role in meeting this challenge. It, a comprehensive solution requires community participation and it also requires the leadership and commitment of the county. Thank you. Thank you. The following people are here in support but do not wish to speak. Nancy Smith, Debbie Rick Gower, Susan Sandoval, Lynette Arceo, and Adela Arcelo. 
There's a motion on the floor. There is a uh, existing motion on the floor to approve the item. Is there any discussion from the board? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. By unanimous vote, motion carries. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go on to the, uh, to the other parts of the agenda. Uh, if you'd like, uh, you can feel free to stick around or you can uh, leave if you'd like. Your choice. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and take a 10 minute break so that, that way we can uh, give you a few moments as well. Uh, we'll recess to the sound of the gavel.
call this meeting back to order. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move to uh, economic development and tourism, item number 20, fiscal year 2014 marketing plan. Brett, if you could please come up, identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Supervisors. My name's uh, Brent DeRod. I'm with uh, Visit Tucson. Uh, first, wanted to just thank you so much. We really appreciate your partnership and your investment of bed tax revenue in our organization. Uh, to begin, what we'd like to do is show you a video uh, that recaps our 2012-13 fiscal year, our annual report video put together by our very talented VP of Marketing, Allison Cooper. Can we go ahead and uh, roll the video, please? Tourism as an industry touches everybody's lives within this entire community. Tourism is very, very important to our economic stability because it basically uh, adds jobs, adds value, adds wealth to the community by taking very little away. And so it's one of those cleanest of industries that we can promote, and we should do so as much as we practically can. Tourism is such an important industry. Not only does it affect our, our immediate stakeholders, but it affects positively the community at large, because part of those bed tax revenues and all of those sales tax revenues go back into the community to support roads and other community service, police and fire, the general fund, things like that. We, Tucson, the CVB, have had a lot of shots against us. We've had immigration, We've had funding issues, so now it's more important that everyone rallies around that DMO to tell people how great Tucson is. We have never been more positive about the horizon line for the business generally and for Tucson specifically with the things that you're going to see this morning because the appetite the consumer has for that message today has never been better. We've engaged in so much research during the past year, but that's really helped get us to the point where we're at here today. Taking a look at our, our visitor inquiry, visitor analysis studies, uh, we know our top feeder markets for visitors. Uh, we know the zip codes within those markets that deliver the most Tucson uh, visitors. We know how much visitors spent, uh, and we know what they spent that money on. And we also understand now the demographic and the lifestyle traits of those customers. That research that we've done, it shows very clearly, if we get a customer to Tucson once, 70% of them are going to return within the next five years. 50% will return within two years. If we get a customer here, they're going to come back. And I'll tell you what, we're moving in the right direction. active travelers in America, for those of you that don't study this every day, we got about 315 million people in the country, about 115 million households in the country. About half of the households are active travelers. There's the number. One out of five active travelers in America, as of about two months ago, said they're interested in visiting Tucson on a vacation during the next two years. It was pretty much a unanimous decision to bring them on board to do this work. The work that they did, from the research all the way through development, the architecture of the brand, felt to me like it was just spot on, and I'm thrilled about the results. Our budget this year dropped to $6.4 million. That's the lowest mark it's been since the late 1990s. But thanks to increased bed tax investments from Pima County, from the city of Tucson, from the town of Oro Valley in the coming year, that number's gonna reach all the way up to seven million uh, starting July 1. Both the Pasqua Yaki and the Tohono O'odham tribes invest in us annually. Uh, we just wanna thank the tribes uh, for their partnership. The town of Oro Valley is always gonna have a very strong relationship with the CVB, only because you guys did it the old fashioned way. You took the time to develop relationships, you took the time to craft and hone those relationships, and together you have done a remarkable job about creating actual partnerships to where you can create the win-win situation.
the point to be made is the smart dollar in marketing is no longer chasing the repeat visitor. The smart dollar in marketing is going after the first timer. Now, one of the other things we do is we measure what's important to people when they go into a website. The content that is related to the ability of the visitor to find a good deal has always risen to the top. But the other thing we notice over the past three to five years is that more and more the visualization of what I can find in the destination is almost achieving parity in terms of its importance. I want to be able to vicariously experience the destination, which is why the visuals that are presented online about your destination are so vitally important, as they have to provide the, the full kaleidoscope of the visitor experience that is appropriate and available for someone who is interested in visiting Tucson. We believe that video is a powerful way for us to really sell this experience. 89% of all leisure travelers watch online video. And then for all of those out there in the lodging community, next year on a mobile device alone, there will be $24 billion in bookings. ¿Qué tal amigos? Estamos aquí en el zoológico Reed Park Zoo en Tucson, Arizona. Estamos aquí entre la Broadway y la Villa. Fast stop. Quick, give me some sugar. Did he just kiss him? Still, I'm trying to help! Are you out of your mind? The brand is a value proposition that's going to serve us for many years to come. You know, we're going to build campaigns from this and we'll embellish upon it. We're gonna integrate, free yourself across all divisions of our organization. Tucson has so much going for it to make it appealing to visitors. See for yourself, come visit Tucson. that as we uh, we pull up our uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, taking a look at uh, the 13-14 uh, fiscal year as well um, just wanted to uh, uh, again just point out uh, we really appreciate the very engaged service on our board of directors from uh, Supervisor Sharon Bronson uh, does a wonderful job of representing uh, your interests and, and providing input in terms of, uh, of what we're doing as well thank you looks like we've got presentation up here we go uh, just taking a look at uh, our mission and vision. Uh, you saw that uh, very briefly in the, uh, the video that was shown uh, earlier. Part of the Pima County performance audit that was performed uh, on our organization a couple of years ago encouraged our board of directors to take a look at updating uh, our new mission statement. And we've done that, as you, uh, you see there, uh, and also adopted a, a vision statement as well that uh, I think succinctly uh, takes a look at uh, what we're trying to accomplish. As we look at, at tourism in Pima County, the impacts are massive. Uh, when we uh, looked at the, uh, the direct spending from 2010, it was at $2 billion. Today, that number is at $2.6 billion, based on the research done by Dean Runyon Associates through uh, the Arizona Office of Tourism. So we're certainly uh, very happy to see that moving in the right direction. Taking a look at our budget for the coming year, uh, as noted in the video, we were at 6.4 million last year. Uh, we're upwards of, of 7 million this year. So uh, really starting to move in the right direction, which we're uh, very happy about. Uh, the primary increase came from the city of Tucson. Uh, it increased the percentage of bed tax that's investing in our organization. So that was about $500,000 to our bottom line. Uh, we think that uh, uh, your investment this year based on the percentage will be up somewhat based on uh, better performance out there in this industry. Oro Valley's also uh, stepped up its investment. When we take a look at the, uh, the five entities listed there, other than private sector, that represents 90% of our budget in the coming year. Private sector represents approximately 10%. Uh, just recently, uh, Strong Point Research in Tucson, uh, they conducted a survey of our stakeholders. Uh, it was the first time that was done in the past two years, and they did that in August and September. What we found in, in terms of uh, the results uh, from that, the current performance of Visit Tucson uh, was gauged by 87% uh, of those respondents as good, very good, or excellent. Taking a look back at uh, the past couple of years, 77% indicated that uh, uh, our performance is better uh, than it was uh, previously as well. So we feel like we're moving in the right direction from that standpoint. 
Taking a look at the, uh, the strengths there as well, uh, you can see what's listed. Uh, these are the areas that our stakeholders feel that we're doing the best job at at this point. Uh, so taking a look at strengthening the regional tourism industry, uh, the branding campaign that we came out with as well, uh, being able to improve relationships with our, our government partners, uh, and then certainly marketing the region and providing more exposure uh, to our partners and our materials. Looking at the economic impact, a lot of that was spelled out in the annual report video. Uh, 2.6 billion was the number uh, that was listed. What we were able to calculate directly from our efforts, and we try to be as conservative as possible with that, uh, but if you add up the numbers in the purple column, it comes to about $214 million, uh, is what uh, through leisure uh, travel that we were able to generate, taking a look at the meetings, the sports, and certainly from a film standpoint as well. Based on our $6.4 million budget last year, that would be a $33 uh, return on investment from that aspect. Uh, one of the things that also came out of the uh, aforementioned uh, audits, the Pima County uh, performance audit of our uh, organization, was that we needed to engage in a, a comprehensive travel branding initiative uh, for Tucson, for Pima County, and for Southern Arizona. Uh, we thank you very much for that, uh, that direction. Uh, for us, it was certainly the right thing to do for the region. Uh, we appreciate the push in that regard, and we really looked at it as an opportunity. We hired a company out of Kansas City, MMGY Global, uh, to come in and conduct that for us. Uh, typically, with our vendors, we always go uh, inside Tucson whenever we can. I think in the case of trying to develop a travel brand, we really wanted to take a look at an entity that had that outside expertise. Uh, MMGY Global, they've done travel branding initiatives for many cities, counties, regions, states, even a couple of countries out there as well. And we were certainly very pleased with, uh, with what they brought to the table. Research was mentioned uh, extensively in the, uh, the video that we just uh, showed. Uh, what we started with was uh, stakeholder surveys, and, and again, uh, several of you were part of that, uh, that process. Uh, we appreciate the involvement there. Uh, the visitor inquiry, visitor analysis studies that gave us quantitative and qualitative data on our customers so that we have a really good feel for when they book and how much money they spend. We did consumer focus groups in Denver and Chicago. We were asking customers, what is it that makes you interested in Tucson? Why would you or would you not visit this region? And we got some great input from that standpoint as well. We also did online surveys on our website that allowed visitors and locals uh, to provide us with quite a bit of input in terms of, again, what they think makes this region special. Uh, and then also, uh, again, based on that, uh, that video that we just showed, uh, MMGY Global included us in Portrait of the American Traveler, which is a study that they do annually. It was the first time they ever included Tucson-specific questions in there, and that gave us the background to understand that, again, out of all those active traveler families, uh, that uh, we've got 20% that are interested in, in visiting Tucson. We just have to make sure we get the message out to those folks. Uh, out of all that research came a, a brand position. What we wanted to take a look at is a, a distinctive space uh, that we could own. Our, our previous positioning, uh, you know, again, just took a look at uh, us as being the real Southwest. In that research that we did, what we found is that uh, when we put the concept of real Southwest out there, people were affiliating Santa Fe with that or San Antonio and some other destinations. People thought it fit with Tucson, but maybe not as specifically as it did with other places. So we really want to try to find a, a space that we can own that's distinctive. And so that takes us to the brand promise. And as you can see, that plays on the concept of freedom. What we found in talking to customers throughout the United States, in Mexico, and other places as well, when people come when, um, to Tucson on vacation, when they're traveling, they're looking for an opportunity to escape their daily reality. They want to come to a place that's very different, a place where uh, you know, maybe there's not the, the same freeway congestion, a place where maybe they can enjoy that outdoor adventure recreation, the hiking, uh, the cycling, uh, you know, just the unique culture that we have to offer as well. And that's what really led us to the concept of free yourself. We feel like, again, in terms of being an oasis for those travelers, that uh, the Tucson uh, certainly represents that. And that concept of freedom certainly fits very well. What I want to do is just show you uh, just some quick examples of our, our print advertising. Uh, based on all that research, based on the brand positioning, it was time for us at that point uh, to go back and, and take a look at, uh, from an advertising standpoint, how do we bring that to life? And so uh, print and digital advertising, we've got train wraps going right now in Portland and in Chicago, uh, and also outdoor and television advertising, uh, just to try to get the, the Tucson message out there as well. I'm going to start here with uh, our outdoor adventure recreation uh, print uh, advertisement that we're running. You're going to see cycling, uh, not only in our advertising, but as we bring that to life through our website and other materials, uh, the whole concept of, of that outdoor uh, experience and cycling is going to be a very important component of that as we move ahead. Uh, attractions. 
Pima County attractions and other attractions throughout this region, when we market to families, the attractions are something that we absolutely want to make sure uh, that we lead with. We think that that's a, certainly a strength for the destination and we'll push forward with that. Um, from a dining aspect as well, unique dining. We want to make sure that as we're out there uh, talking to folks about what makes Tucson distinctive and different, uh, the concept of, uh, of the tremendous Mexican food restaurants that we have here, and then also locally owned and operated restaurants. Uh, there's not, uh, you know, people can, can certainly indulge in a chain restaurant if they choose to, but we want to talk about what's unique and different and what separates Tucson. Also the resort spa golf experience. Uh, we certainly led with that for the most part uh, in previous years from an advertising aspect. Based on the product strength that we have here in this market, we will always talk about the resorts, the spas, the golf. Uh, that will always be a, a top seller for us, if you will. Uh, and just wanted to show you how we're going to depict those attributes as well as we move ahead. And then as we work with younger audiences and talk about uh, what we have to offer, we want to talk about the nightlife in Tucson. We want to talk about downtown and some of those experiences as well uh, that we think could really make this, uh, this destination uh, inviting to those travelers. Uh, taking a look now, uh, we want to look at the uh, Attractions Passport. This is something that we've partnered on with Pima County and the uh, Southern Arizona Attractions Alliance for. I think this is the 11th year now. Tom Moulton can correct me if I'm, yes, that's correct. Um, what we look at is we produce a, an actual Attractions Passport with coupons in there uh, that provide uh, admission into the different attractions. So we do that from a printed standpoint. We've also developed a mobile app again this year that uh, would allow people to download uh, this actual uh, Attractions Passport and then they can redeem those coupons uh, with their mobile devices as well. Uh, again, from a marketing aspect, just taking a look back as well, uh, you know, our, our job from an advertising standpoint, we're trying to drive as many consumers as we possibly can uh, to our website. And you see that there, visittucson.org. Uh, we want to try and drive as many unique visits as we can and uh, do everything we can to ensure that Tucson's represented and Pima County and Southern Arizona to the best of our ability uh, there as well. We've um, overhauled this site in the past year, brand new technology, certainly a new look and feel. We've also created a new mobile website uh, and with more and more people accessing us through mobile devices. It's vital uh, that we've got a, a mobile website that, uh, that holds up. From a Mexico marketing standpoint, what you're looking at there in the chart, those are the number of room nights booked per year through our VamosOfTucson.com website. And so you can see uh, Felipe Garcia, our executive vice president, I feel like he's done a fabulous job in terms of, of uh, representing this region, driving more tourism here uh, from Mexico, and then also uh, just the trade aspects of, uh, of what he works on as well. Uh, he just signed on as a, a new correspondent for Mega Noticias in uh, Hermosillo. So he's going to do on a weekly basis two to three minute segments on Pima County, Southern Arizona, uh, being able to talk about the attributes that we have here and, and hopefully drive even more traffic as we move ahead. Sports, you can see the goals listed there as well. Uh, we just hired a new director of Tucson Sports, Angel Natal. He began yesterday. Uh, bottom line for us is we want to do everything we can to drive more events into Keno Sports Complex and throughout this region as well. We're looking at new events and opportunities to bring in, uh, and I have every belief that uh, we'll be able to grow substantially what we're doing on the sports side uh, here in the coming years as well. Uh, we're also eager to partner with you and with FC Tucson to bring in the Major League Soccer preseason training camps and also the Desert Diamond Cup coming up this winter. Tour and travel, we work with tour operators and travel agents throughout the world. Based on limited staff and budget, we really focus those efforts on Mexico, the United States, Canada, and Western Europe from that aspect as well. Uh, again, we're very proud of what we're doing there. We want to make sure that those tour operators, that they understand Tucson, that they develop product that they can sell to the high-end uh, leisure travelers, and that we get more of those customers here. Convention sales, this is an opportunity for us, I think, in a big way. Um, as our budget decreased from approximately $10 million five years ago down to the $6.4 million last year, we invested less uh, when it came to convention sales and bringing meetings into this destination. Um, you know, based on that, uh, that decreased investment, we saw decreased results. We have invested more in that area this year. Uh, your resorts absolutely need a strong meeting space if they're going to prosper. And so what we've seen in the first four months of the fiscal year, again, with increased investment, more bookings, more room nights, greater economic impact as we move ahead. Uh, film Tucson, uh, what we're looking at there as well, we've got a, a Tucson film office. We're trying to go out and work with as many feature films as we possibly can. Television series, especially reality series, seem to, uh, uh, to, to generate here uh, in Tucson and, and Pima County, and then also commercial shoots. Last year, the direct spending alone just from that sector was, uh, was about $6 million. And so um, 
i think you're all familiar you know there was a statewide film legislation that was proposed going through the state legislature the past couple of years that did not pass and that puts us at a disadvantage with competing against specifically new mexico and about forty other states out there that have that what we're doing now is visit tucson pima county city of tucson we're actually all working together to take a look at what types of in kind incentives can we bring to the table goods services facilities things that would lessen the cost for somebody to bring some type of production here as well and so we're uh, enthused by the, uh, the early results uh, from that standpoint and then just to wrap up my presentation again you know we feel like we've made uh, substantive changes to our organization during the past 18 months you know all in an effort to be as accountable uh, as transparent and as effective as we possibly can uh, we feel good about the direction of our organization but we uh, certainly stand ready uh, you know for any types of uh, input comments that you might have to help guide us as we uh, we move ahead with our efforts the next step for us is as we take a look at this report card again developed as part of the Pima County audit we need to see how we can increase uh, Tucson's market share uh, when it comes to the 14 to 15 destinations that we compete against for meetings for leisure travel we've got to increase the occupancy we've got to increase the hotel revenue the number of visitors um, so again organizationally we feel good but as a destination we've got a long way to go and with that I thank you for your time questions for the board so yes. thank you mr. chairman I, I just wanted to make a comment Brad because I think visit Tucson has come a long way I particularly like the goal of, of essentially having one-third of our travel come from Mexico and uh, the folks who have been working in the Mexico office and particularly Felipe uh, Garcia have done a great job <clears throat> and I'd like to commend them on that and uh, that's a market that needs to continue to grow uh, not just because it brings new money into our community from from uh, folks who have very often never been to Tucson <clears throat> But also, it improves uh, our relations with our neighbors. And I can't think of anything that's more important, and especially considering all the difficulties that Arizona has been through in the last 15 years with those same populations. So mm -hmm. to me, that's a very important aspect of what we're doing here as well. And I'd particularly also like to uh, <clears throat> offer my appreciation for the work that Visit Tucson has done on helping us with uh, the Desert Diamond Cup and bringing Major League soccer spring training to uh, Spinoz Kino sports complex and um, look forward to continuing on in that relationship as well because I think there's a lot of potential there and I think it's very uh, fitting that Mr. Huckleberry in his comments in that video because I actually watched the video you know um, his comments in there about clean industry and clean opportunities for our community are right there when we talk about um, tourism and folks visiting our community and I think it's important that we all want to keep our air clean and we want to keep our water clean because it is a powerful uh, draw in an industry that brings uh, you know what was the figure again uh, how many billions of dollars to our community? 2.6 uh, billion annually. and we're talking about 22,000 jobs I believe you that's were talking correct. about Brad yes, so that's Mr. a very Brad. impressive figure and and we can't lose sight of that when we're facing uh, a lot of uh, questions about uh, mineral exploration and other things that would uh, really devalue our uh, precious uh, Sonoran Desert. So I just want to make those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Miller. Um, Mr. Gerard, um, yesterday we had a conversation about Portland. Um, I noticed that wasn't one, on one of the feeder cities, and we right. just got that flight in, direct flight here into Tucson. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Certainly. Uh, we were uh, actually uh, delighted to be invited by uh, uh, Tucson Airport Authority to accompany them back to uh, Alaska Airlines. Uh, we went back there initially in August of 2012, followed up by bringing out Alaska Airlines executives three months later. Um, and then that led to the uh, inauguration of a uh, nonstop uh, Tucson-Portland flight uh, that just began November 1st. Uh, I bring up the timing just to show how long it can take just to develop one new route, unfortunately. Um, the biggest hindrance that we have as a destination when it comes to tourism, and especially on the meeting side, is the lack of nonstop flights from some of our top, what should be feeder cities out there as well. So we're uh, focused very strongly on partnering with the Tucson Airport Authority to the extent possible. Uh, we want to make sure this, uh, this Portland route works. And so uh, we've got the train wrapped in Portland. Um, 
and again allison cooper has done a wonderful job there's a lot of print advertising going on digital advertising we've even created tucson coffee sleeves that are being served on a coffee shops along the the light rail route just to help try to emphasize that as well we're trying to show alaska that if we can make this route successful we'd love to see seattle go from a daily route to, to uh, two flights per day going out of there. We'd love to see service from San Jose and there's other uh, cities as well. So we're very focused on trying to ensure that we do everything we can to augment air service. Yeah, I really like that idea and also, you know, might try the microbrews too. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> Absolutely. people up there. Um, the other thing was uh, this, you mentioned that the state legislation did not pass. Could Correct. you expand a little bit on that? Certainly. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, there was a push to try and, and put through uh, statewide legislation from a, a film uh, aspect to provide incentives back to uh, especially feature films because those are, are typically the, uh, the largest uh, amounts of spending you can get in one fell swoop. Uh, but not only that, uh, also taking a look at television series where there's a rebate back on direct spending. Uh, that did not make it through the legislature. Uh, at this point, after a couple of years of, uh, of going down that route, uh, the primary focus this year is to try and create a, a statewide film office. Uh, and we think that that could have some benefits as well, along with hopefully some of the regional incentives that we're looking at. Uh, a good example, probably the, the best uh, tourism that Albuquerque has had going for quite some time is, is due to Breaking Bad. Um, they created Breaking Bad tours, if you will. Not that that's, you know, just in terms of the, the content, you know, necessarily what we want to have here, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of people coming to look at these different uh, uh, places and venues. They affiliate that with the uh, the area, and that does drive it. Um, I just was curious why the the state didn't pass that. What, we just what the uh, objection was the main object objection to it, it. It started at the governor's office, and it kind of worked its way down uh, from that standpoint. Um, I think the support throughout southern Arizona, including our legislators, uh, was very strong. Uh, Pima County had it on its legislative agenda, as did the city of Tucson. There was strong support from this region, but we couldn't carry the day in Phoenix. Okay, and. Um, Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wesico. I just want to say appreciate your visit today. Accept the report with vigor. Thank you for being here. Delighted that uh, Felipe is not here because I know somewhere in Mexico he's making deals. <laughs> uh, I did read in the paper that there's going to be an expansion of a Mexican economic development office possibly for the city of Tucson. I know we're in the capital of Sonora. Is there any chance we can make it to Mexico DFA, uh, well, Mexico City, for a meeting? Uh, is there an office potential there? Is there any way that we can see a value in having a presence there as far as tourism from the, the national capital? Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Supervisor Carroll, I would say uh, yes to that. I mean, as we take a look at the opportunities in, in Mexico City, uh, I certainly think from a tourism standpoint, there's opportunity. I think even more importantly is the trade side of things there as well. Uh, we've seen the city of Phoenix move forward with plans uh, to try and create a, a trade office there as well. Uh, I know the city of Tucson was looking at, is there a partnership opportunity there? Is it going in separately from that aspect? Uh, we're eager to be a, a part of those conversations. Uh, what I would say is just uh, based on how Felipe, through our office, Felipe Garcia has, has uh, pushed forward. Uh, we think that uh, creating a presence in Mexico City would be uh, really vital in terms of really trying to increase trade coming from uh, Mexico in general. As we look at uh, our visitor centers right now, we're uh, set up solely in, in Sonora. So we're in Hermosillo, we're in Ciudad Obregón. Uh, but you know, looking at kind of that next step, it would make sense to look at Mexico City. Thank you so much for being here. Mr. Chairman, I just have one more comment was, um, I just would like to say that the uh, mobile uh, website is fabulous. I mean, that is obviously uh, just a, you're, we're ahead of the curve on that. I think it's great. And um, that uh, Felipe is one of the most infectious people that I've ever met. He, he and, is the absolute uh, best. Yeah, he's, he's just a hard driver. And um, yes, he's doing a great job. Thank you. you. Know, and, I, and I really enjoyed his presentation when, he came, when you came to visit my office. Thank you. Thank you. I want it so noted that me and Supervisor Miller just agreed on something, you know. It's an unusual occurrence, so I just thought I'd make special note of that right now. Uh, now you've got me on the mic. Uh, no, I, you know, it's rather an interesting day. We had the 5 all boat on pack, and I think we were all in agreement that the that Visit Tucson has really taken the next big leap forward and is uh, doing good things, and we hope we'll do some great things this coming year. Thank you. Brent, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you and your organization uh, and your staff for, for everything you've done to turn uh, the organization around and uh, have it headed in the correct direction at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
<laughs> All right, at this point, we'll move uh, back to the regular agenda, which is item number two under <laughs> Flood Control District Board. It's been a long day. Back to page one, huh? <laughs> page one, later. agenda item, regular agenda item number two. We're on uh, item. Oh. Regular item uh, nine, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, I was. I, like I said, item number nine under Flood Control District Board and resolution number 2013 FC8. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second to approve the item. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. And Mr. Chairman, under uh, Flood Control District Board item 10, Repairing and Habitat mit Mitigation, I'll move that item. Second. second. Motion and a second to approve item number 10. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving to Improvement District Board item number 11, resolution number 6. What's the will of the board? Mr. Chairman, I move item 6, resolution number, excuse me, item 11, resolution number 6. Second. Um, motion and a second to approve item number 11 all, and resolution number 6. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Uh, we are now moving to Zoning Enforcement Board of Appeals. Um, and that's item 12 and 13. Obviously, we will take them separately. I just want to remind everyone that by our own rules, uh, both parties shall be limited to five minutes apiece. Um, so, Sam Quick, do you have the set? Okay, so item number 12, uh, uh, Appeal of Hearing Officer's Decision, P. 13 CV 00086-14241 South Avenida Don Felipe. Staff report, please keep in mind that you are limited to five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Pima County Development Services received a complaint about uh, the conditions uh, on the property located at 4241 South Avenida Don Felipe. As a result of an investigation, um, there were some violations that were noted on the property and a citation was issued. Uh, there was a hearing held. Um, the hearing officer found in favor of Pima County and uh, issued a uh, judgment uh, that the property was in violation, that uh, Mr. Otero was responsible, and a fine of uh, $750 was established uh, with $150 due and 600 suspended for 60 days pending compliance. Uh, the reason that the uh, that fine amount was recommended by development services was that there have been previous similar uh, conditions located on that or found on that property as a result of uh, similar complaints. I believe Mr. Otero's um, appeal is with regard to the amount of the fine rather than the uh, substance of the complaint and subsequent finding of responsibility. Uh, it's uh, development services uh, recommendation that the hearing officers um, decision be upheld. Thank you. Any, any questions from the board? Okay, if there are no questions from the board, I'm going to go ahead and ask the clerk to reset the, the timer. And please present you, uh, your, uh, your side of the appeal and you have five minutes. I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead. If you don't mind, I'll go ahead and speak. Please and identify yourself for the record. I'm Robert Otero, son. This is my father, Robert Otero, also senior. Um, I, you know, we're here today, you know, not only for the fine, I understand the fine, the fine is not that big of an issue. Uh, the bigger issue that we're having is the continuous complaints. And what we're trying to prove here today is harassment. That's what we're getting, we're get, what's happening. What we have proof here um, in chronological order, I apologize that we don't have um, copies for everybody. I can, I can start over here and you guys can look through them. Um, is that okay? Sure. Yeah. I believe in 2009, um, we were uh, burglarized at this at our, our at our residence. 2003. Okay, 2003, we were burglarized, and it was by um, on down the line. Eventually, what happened is one of these items came up through uh, um, someone tried pawning it, came up back to our property, ended up being our neighbor, which is Mr. Alvarez. Okay, his his children were. Um, we didn't, you know. Um, file any complaints against him or anything. It was the state that did it, um, but the state was forced him to pay X amount of dollars to, to my father, which he did. 
As soon as that happened, uh, we started the first complaint was by Mr. Alvarez. It was in 2009. And the uh, um, other complaints were with the same handwriting. If you guys can read those notes, it's the same handwriting, the same wording of the complaints. So we're thinking it's the same. It's Mr. Alvarez that keeps putting these complaints. We've complied to uh, what he previously said in, in the county records. Um, with uh, previous citations. It's the same citations over and over. A previous inspector went out there, we've dealt with this, and they were approved in the county records. It says there that they were everything that was approved, the dirt, the trailers, everything. Now that there's a new inspector and the previous inspector retired, now we got a new inspector coming out with the same complaints. Now, is one inspector better than the other inspector? We don't know, obviously that's the case. My father went further ahead and um, you know, reached Mr. Elias' office and um, their response to us, well, well, you know what, it's, that's the law, that's the um, compliant, you have to comply with the Pima County rules and, and, and we, we have done that, we have done that. I mean, it's proved in Pima County that we've done it. The problem is, is that they're telling us, well, you need to do the same thing with, our, with your other neighbors because our other neighbors are in the same situation. As a matter of fact, Mr. Alvarez in those pictures right there, at his own house, he has a motor home and it's not screened. Now we just, you know, we, every single project in our property is, has been uh, plans, permitted and, and approved and, um, and um, you know, we, we've complied to everything that we can possibly do, but we're just, you know, it's just the continuing, 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 and it's not gonna stop. Somebody needs to realize at Pima County that this is harassment. We're being singled out and, and, and dealt with, and, and, and what are we supposed to do? Go out there and complain about our other neighbors? We don't want that. We're not that type of people. You know, the Alvarez's um, dog came over to our yard, went inside, killed one of our chickens. We didn't even put a complaint. You know, it's like, well, it happened, it happened. That's just part of it. But yet we keep getting harassed. And that's what we're trying to prove today is to, somebody needs to realize that the inspectors need to do a better job. They need to be understand, you know, we had all the information, we went to somebody, but they're just saying comply, comply, comply. We're complying but nobody's listening to what the real problem is. And the real problem is, is we've got one neighbor that because his, his children violated us and now they have to pay, now he wants to, he's just making us, okay, well, we're gonna make him pay also. And you know, we've complied and it's just, you know, what's gonna happen? We're gonna comply, we've built, a, we've built a wall, we've done everything that we had to do and we're just gonna have to continue doing this. We're gonna be here again in the future what do we need to do? Because obviously the fine is not a problem. We can pay the fine, that's not a problem. The problem is we're gonna, we're, we're gonna be continuing to be harassed and what do we do, where do we go at this point? That's what we're here to, to, to try to make a point. Questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, Mr. I guess I'm a little confused. I'm a staff, are they in compliance currently? Uh, a recent inspection uh, this past Friday revealed that they're very close. Um, the, the trailer in question, one of the trailers in question has been removed. It was the larger one that was more difficult to screen. The remaining trailer is a more standard size travel trailer. So, so essentially they're in compliance. Uh, they're, they're close. If they can okay. finish up the wall project, it, I would say that they would be in okay. compliance. Yeah. And they've never really, they've always fixed any of the complaints that have come up about them and never had a problem with them before in that sense? Uh, they, There's a long history of stuff here. Right, yeah. and in each instance there has been at least substantial compliance in the cases we're okay. um, and, and the question about neighbors that continue complaining, what's the process that we have to follow in that kind of situation? Well, we're in a difficult position when we receive anonymous complaints. Um, we're, we're obligated to look into them. Um, you know, once we find that there is a violation on our property, the county becomes a complainant, not the person that turned in the information. So we're happy to receive any kind of direction from the board with regard to anonymous complaints. Well, I just think that uh, at a certain point, you know, we need to have more practical uh, application of the rules fairly so that, you know, we're not consistently going back here for the same things. It seems to me, Mr. Otero, though, that there were some issues at the house that you needed to fix. 
and you fix them. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate your candor in coming in here and being very honest about your relationship with your neighbors, too, and that that's a problem for you. Because uh, very often, people don't want to say that kind of stuff. And, and so I can appreciate the difficult situation that has put you and your family in, in to, uh, uh, to, to have to confront all of this. You know, my sense is, is that uh, we make sure that uh, Mr. Otero's property is in, is in line with uh, uh, the request that you've made and we waive the fine um, on this particular issue, but that we also uh, start to take a look at what our rules are about ongoing investigations and, and neighbors that seem to complain on a, on a regular basis about particular individual families. Um, because that really doesn't serve anybody's purpose, and I, and I understand your complaint. I don't know that I want to call it harassment, but nevertheless, it certainly happens. And we're all aware of that because it's happened in every single one of our districts at one time or another. But uh, if we could take a look at that and take a look at what rules uh, we could uh, uh, work with to make it a little better for us all. Uh, and I make a motion that uh, as soon as Mr. Otero gets his property under um, um, <coughs> conformance with the request that we've made, we waive the fine and, and move on. Is that in close the hearing? Close public hearing. Second. Mr. Chairman. As a resume, Miller. I just had a couple of questions. Um, the background information we got from staff, are you telling me that's been updated? Because what we got was there were prior violations that hadn't been in compliance for several years, but you're telling me now that they're substantially in compliance with the complaints. Yes, there have been previous complaints on this property, and each one of the ca cases has been resolved. Um, okay. By one so means what or is another. what is left for them to get into compliance? Is it uh, the current open case is uh, they would need to finish uh, a wall that's around the property. So uh, they're in process of building this wall. That is correct, and they do have permits for such. Yeah. Okay, I see it. Well, yeah, and I, I guess I have a concern in that it looks like this family is being singled out, and they're obviously in the neighborhood. There are other violations that are quite similar that um, are not being prosecuted by us. So I, I view that as, as a um, real substantive challenge to how we handle um, zoning violations and code enforcement. And I know we're not out there taking names and we simply don't have the staffing so what really happens is if somebody calls and, co and complains, we go out. But if nobody complains, then nobody notices and, and there is no enforcement. So we need to strike some kind of balance in how we do right. that. Uh, I'll leave it to you as the as the, the, the That's a good point. And, and, and Supervisor Bronson brings up a really important issue. You yourself said when we send an inspector out and there's a violation, then Pima County becomes the complainant. So I assume that as they go out during their inspections, they might look at other properties in the area and see similar kind of violations and then put Pima County in the situation of being the complainant there. I, I don't want a rash of these kind of problems happening. But on the other hand, fair is fair. If there's a number of complaints of one family continues to get to be singled out uh, because they are being cited on, by anonymous folks, then the question begs as to why those other violations don't get observed as well. <clears throat> so I'd just like to have all that stuff reviewed and looked at so that we can make sure that we are following proper procedure and that people are being treated fairly and not harassed by neighbors who yeah. might dislike them for whatever reason. Right. I mean, we certainly all try and stay away from that situation. None of us want to fight with our neighbors, but it happens. All right, the motion before us is on uh, uh, pending uh, compliance with the current uh, violation, the fine be waived, and by way of staff direction and examination of the process that we're using for a more balanced approach and so that no one family gets singled out in, in such an approach. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it by unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you.
Is there someone here uh, on item number 13, uh, the 6285, the appellant? Is the appellant here? Okay, I don't have the appellant. Okay. We'll uh, restart the timer for the staff report. Um, by, again, by our own rules, five minutes. Please proceed. Uh, this is re with regard to a complaint that was filed on the property located at uh, 6285 North Papaya Place uh, property uh, under the uh, control of a Brad Campbell. Um, again, uh, this was a, a complaint that was received. Uh, an inspection revealed that there was a violation of open storage of junk, used materials, um, and operable vehicles. Uh, again, this property has been the subject of uh, previous complaints dating back to 1996 for exactly the same um, issues with regard to the uh, outdoor storage of car parts, junk, um, inoperable vehicles, um, uh, boats on trailers without license plates, etc. Uh, because this was the uh, fourth time that we've been out to that property, um, the hearing officer found that the property owner was responsible for the violation, a recommendation of a $750 fine with $375 due and $375 suspended was issued by the hearing officer. Uh, when, when that uh, judgment was issued, the uh, appeal was made to the board. Uh, a recent inspection reveals that there has been no progress towards compliance on this property. So where's Miller? Mr. Chairman, that was my question is, has there been any type of progress in, on the compliance? And you're saying none, and this has been going on since 1996? That's correct. Okay. All right, let me ask one more time. Is the appellant for item number 13, the address being 6285 North Papaya Place here? Here, seeing no one, Supervisor Miller. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to close the public hearing and uphold the hearing officer's decision. Second. Motion and a second before us is that we close the public hearing and uphold the uh, hearing officer's decision. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Board of Supervisors sitting in regular session, consent calendar. Is there anyone here who would like to address the board at a call to the public on con a consent calendar item only? Seeing none, what's the will of the board on the consent uh, calendar uh, agenda as uh, amended? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull two items from the consent calendar for separate vote. I move to pull two items from the consent calendar for separate vote. Item number three. Hold on. Three and Which three. is on page ten. number 10 for separate discussion and vote. And then item number 13, which is on page 12 for se separate discussion and vote. Okay, this vote is on the uh, pulling of items number 3 and 10 of the consent calendar. Uh, all, uh, no, 3 and 13. Oh, 13. 3 and 13, I'm sorry. 3 and 13, yes, yeah, on page 13, it's on page 10. Uh, do we have a second on the, uh, on the motion? Second. Second, okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me move the rest of consent in its entirety at this there's point. A, there's a motion on the floor. Yeah, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, item number 13, I just wanted to note, is also on the addendum as the flood control issue. Oh, okay. Okay, again, the motion before us is I'm pulling uh, for a separate vote and discussion for consent calendar item 3 and number 13. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Um, Supervisor Miller, item number three. Okay, Mr. Chairman, on item number three, um, my question on that was um, the contract expired back in May of 2012. And I was just curious, first of all, why was this contract allowed to expire and is just coming back before the board? And I had a question uh, regarding the prorate of the uh, amount of money that is going between Pima County and, and the um, Pima Community College District. Mr. Elgaberry. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Miller, the contract originally expired because Pima College actually um, abandoned their, their use of the facility. They turned it into and, and leased it to a uh, charter school. 
that charter school then went out of business and Pima College is now a renewed interest in providing classes at the facility so it's really um, kind of allowing them to come back and use the facility that they'd used previously and um, in addition to that um, they're also um, taking um, some positive steps with regard to the Community Performing Arts Center and helping them with uh, their utilization of the building that uh, relieving them of costs that they had incurred previously because of now community college sharing utility expenses. Okay, and they're prorating that? Yes, that's, uh, okay. that's what right. the proration is. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. I haven't, I haven't. Number three. I'd like to move item number three on the consent calendar for facilities management to Pima County Community College District Amendment number two. Second. Motion and a second to approve item number two on the consent, ca three. or three on the consent calendar. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Clearly having a problem with numbers today. Okay. Supervisor Miller, item number 13. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I had some questions on the item number 13, um, where the proposal here is to lower the rent for the ranchers um, due to uh, drought conditions that are making uh, the grazing of cattle more difficult. I just was curious, um, we don't have any financials. This is an independent operator, is my understanding. Do we have any financial data on how this has actually increased the cost of operations? And um, also, uh, we talked about, it, it talks about a cattle transfer fee of $1,320, if you could explain what that is. I know that's a separate item from the, um, the additional, um, or, or excuse me, the redu reduced fees that they want to pay. And finally, the additional responsibilities the manager has taken on was cited as a reason to give him reduced rent. So, and there was nothing in the background material that, that um, explained that. Mr. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Miller. Um, this is a modification agreement that typically we have when we purchase open space, which was in Perito Ranch, where we allow the typically the uh, on-site uh, rancher to remain in place or to lease the property. And I believe this was a lease uh, to the Parsons uh, brothers at one time, which is now uh, the uh, present uh, group that we're looking at as a different owner. The um, and, and what we've simply done is basically um, allow them to remain on the site to manage the property for us from purposes of trespass or litter control and management of that and to retain the assets that we originally purchased and a, a, reasonable, a reasonable state of maintenance uh, for ranching operations. And so this is just simply trying to help keep them on the property because if they were to leave the property, our cost would be even more, and so that's the, the purpose. The fees, and, and we can probably get you more information with regard to the cattle transfer fee. A lot of that sometimes is related to the state uh, grazing leases, uh, because this property is not only fee property, but it encompasses a grazing lease uh, okay. arrangement from the state. So if they were to move it around, this fee would have to be paid? Y yes. If they moved it from one leased area to another? Okay, thank yes. you. And, and I think, you know, in the net effect is that, uh, you know, cattle ranchers uh, th all throughout probably southwest are having difficult times because of the drought, and, you know, it's on our interest to keep them on the property as long as possible. Thank you for your explanation. Mr. Chairman. Where's the girl? Mr. Chairman, uh, I just want to follow up on that. You can go to any feed store and ask any rancher, or you can go to anyone in the business, on especially the east part of Pima County and you'll hear about the great drought that has affected their ability to work their ranches. Uh, you can also see the great devastating effects of the drought on the Agua Caliente Park currently, which out of the three lakes we have uh, barely one alive and on life support. So the ranch uh, 
problem is obviously illustrated for our own taxpayers in the ownership of agua caliente park which is a in east pima county park off soldiers trail if you've never been there and identify the effects of the drought for your very self thank you very much mr chairman i'll move the item Motion and a second to approve item number 13 on the consent calendar. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Chair would entertain motion on the remainder of consent as amended. Move the remainder as amended. Second. Motion and a second to approve the remainder of consent in uh, as amended. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving on to county administrator, item number 16. Mr. Chairman, I will move under county administrator. I'll move item 16. Second. Motion and a second to approve item number 16. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving on to item number 17. Mr. Mr. Madam, Mr. Chairman, if there's no presentation by staff on this item. We do I not have a presentation. I do have one speaker. Well, I'd like to go ahead and move the item. It's okay. an economic development issue that I take uh, seriously this morning. I move item 17, the El Tour de Tucson funding. Second. I Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Miller. Um, I just had some comments on, on this item. Um, I, I, it's obvious that we need to fund this, but it's, it's very concerning to me that we have no uh, sponsorship for this uh, El Tour de Tucson. That's my understanding to date. And that um, we're hearing from Mr. Durab that bicycling is so important in our community, especially the El Tour brings in a tremendous amount of money. And that I hope that we uh, consider this when we're looking at our roads next year, um, the funding for the roads that we need to add. And I know, you know, you may not agree, but I think the roads are extremely important. I have several friends who ride in the El Tour, and these people that ride in the El Tour spend a tremendous amount of money on their bicycles, anywhere from five to 15000 even more. And when they're riding on the roads uh, with these very expensive bicycles, um, I, what I'm hearing is they're not coming back because they spend and invest all these money in their bicycles. So I, again, think um, we do need to uh, fund this, and I, I will definitely support it. But um, I think it speaks to our um, Visit Tucson presentation this morning. Mr. Garrod expressed the extreme importance of bicycling in Tucson. So I hope we consider that in future votes. Thank you very much. M Mr. Chairman. So let's go. On the issue, I appreciate the comments. Um, I do realize that part of our legislative agenda this year is to uh, get more funding for transportation. Uh, does this mean that are we going to be able to have a, a route map to look at to uh, <coughs> determine future investment in this El Tour de Tucson, Mr. Huckleberry? Can you provide a map of the current 111 or how many miles is it, sir? I could never even fathom riding that far. 110. 110 miles and one to cool off. Okay, could I get a map of that to, to, uh, it's on the website. to, to put yes. in our package for uh, a follow-up to this? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Huckleberry. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, a, a couple of points here. One of the reasons for the increased financial uh, support by the city and the county is that they have lost their title sponsor. We're hopeful that they will get a new title sponsor because they do bring about 8,000 8, to 9,000 riders, and uh, probably about half of those are from outside the community, if not more. Um, and I think Supervisor Miller is correct. Um, they've rerouted and taken Silver Bell out of oh, the route out. this year because it's in such poor condition mm -hmm. and routed that uh, bicycle traffic onto the frontage road. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do need to pay attention. Thank you. All right, the motion before us is on the approval of item number 17. Uh, I do have a speaker. Would we like to hear a speaker or just uh, vote the, uh, the uh, I item? I assume the speaker is in favor. Uh, it doesn't say, but I, b or hold on. And Alfred support, correct. They are in support. All right, all aye. those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. 
ayes have it moving on to item number 18 mr chairman i'll move the item second motion and second to approve item number 18 all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving on to item 19. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the item. Motion and second to approve item 19. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving on to community development and neighborhood conservation, unfinished business, resolution number 2013-99. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and second to approve item number 21. Go on. I, I, I'm still not sure what happened here. I want to know what happened. Um, I know we have Gary Bachman here. Gary, maybe you can give us an answer as to how this all came about here. Um, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Elias. Uh, but you're not Gary Bachman. <laughs> That's okay, Hank. Go ahead. You tell me what happened. Please address your questions through the chair, Mr. Elias. Supervisor, uh, or is that, excuse me, Mr. Atha. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Elias, uh, the uh, resolution corrects a, a problem that occurred because of a uh, failure <coughs> to follow uh, certain HUD, HUD rules. Uh, the the um, error occurred primarily because uh, uh, the project, the affordable housing project, Sunnyside Point, was begun uh, right at the beginning of the recession, and it suffered uh, as as it went to construction. It suffered from the worst of the recessionary impact on housing, uh, and resulted in a um, disagreement with FHA over the insurance <coughs> of the housing. The developer, uh, in calculating the uh, FH or in asking for the FHA insurance and filling out the HUD forms uh, used the actual construction cost um, that was uh, there was some uncertainty about uh, how that should be applied because of the <coughs> of the um, fact that NSP2 funds which were used as a supplemental subsidy for the program uh, did not have clear regulations related to this kind of a project in the, uh, in the end, the HUD decision was to, that it was inappropriate to use as the total cost of the project, the uh, actual construction cost, and that, that we needed to use the appraised value in the depressed market. So who was uncertain about it? Who was uncertain about it? Mm -hmm. About how to apply the rules. Uh, our staff was uncertain about that, and I was uncertain about that. As we did it happen in other NSP programs? No, to my knowledge, it did not happen in other NSP two programs. Mm. Okay, thank you. All right, motion before us is on the approval of item number twenty one, resolution number twenty thirteen dash ninety nine. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving to development services, item I number twenty two. I'll move the item. Second. Second. Um, motion and second to approve item number 22. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving to transportation, item number 23. Mr. Chairman, can we have a staff report? Mr. Chair, members of the board. Mr. Nolio. Yes. Um, this the item before you is um, they're asking for a waiver of the impact fees and um, the, the board is allowed to waive the impact fees if um, it was a affordable housing of motor, uh, moderate to lower income households. There are there, if there is an overriding public interest provided the waiver does not result in an increase in development fee for other properties in the benefit area plan. Um, this particular James Fabens, the property owner, he requests that the Board of Supervisors waive the uh, impact fee for the placement of a residential unit on the property. And um, the reason he's providing for um, the waiver is that when he bought the property, it was full of debris and debris of prior residences that had been there and none of the prior residents had ever been permitted to begin with. And he said that um, he bought the property in 2011 and he cleaned up all of the, um, the debris that was left. 
and so he said that he should only have to pay either the um, the rate of impact fees in the year 2000 when um, the first house was constructed, the first un unpermitted house was constructed. Um, and at that point in time, the impact fees would have been $1,500 versus about the $5,400, which it is today. And um, that is basically, I think, the overall reason that he believes that the board should um, grant the waiver. And um, staff's recommendation is that you deny it. Thank you. Is the uh, is Mr. Favens in the audience? Please come up. Identify yourself for the record. My name is James Craig Favens. I live at 6920 North Trico Road. That's the property that's in question. Uh, for the last two years, I have removed approximately 45 tons of housing debris, uh, several hundred tires, and have unearthed three substandard septic systems. Uh, this was all brought about when I came to get a, uh, a permit to replace the septic system that I drove the tractor into. Uh, I was informed that nothing has ever been permitted on the property. Uh, I feel that somebody had lived there for nine years. They had more than five structures, three barns, two houses, several Jeez. trailers, a pumping system, and a water hole. Uh, all this was destroyed sometime in 2010 and left fallow. And it's been blowing all over the acreage in the area. I purchased this property and like I said, I've been systematically scraping all this junk up and hauling it off to the dump. Uh, now I find that I have to come up with $5,400 to proceed to do the things right that nobody else has ever done. Uh, unfortunately, my health is uh, deteriorating and it's either going to be not do it and live on the dirt like an animal or ask for help from the county so I can at least put a septic tank in there so I don't have to go out there and do it in the bushes. <laughs> and that's basically what I have to do. I'm 27 miles to the nearest septic system that works. And when I'm out there for long periods of time, it's pretty basic. All right, thank you. Thank Ms. you. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Miller. Um, I have some questions for staff. Um, when this property was purchased, was there, um, I mean, it seems to me there was a title search done. And wouldn't you know at that time before you purchased the property that there were, in fact, unpermitted structures on that property? That's been my experience that you would find that information out. Mr. Huckleberry? Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Miller, these look like uh, mobile homes, which is personal property. So they okay. wouldn't have shown up typically in the assessor's roles for real property probably showed up as vacant um, yeah. so my guess is that and it's looked like in the history if you look at the photos it looks like there could have been three almost independent uh, uses probably residential on the property that's now being cleaned up and removed so um, it's very likely that and, and I, I would expect that this probably exists out there today that, that we just don't know because we've not connected uh, you know the real property um, connection to the personal property. Personal. The personal property could be licensed at some other address because you can pick up the mobile home and move it over yeah. and it just gets lost in transition is more than likely what happened. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I am going to move that we, oh this is not a hearing, I'm going to move that we drop the impact fee to 2000 as requested by Mr. Pavins because I think a public purpose has been served and that he has actually cleaned up that property. And, um, and with that, uh, that's my motion. Second. Motion and second uh, before us uh, to approve item number 13 and reduce the impact fee to $2,000. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Eyes have it. Mr. Here. Chairman, j just a clarification. Who's speaking? Uh, right here. Please I think it was, when we don't it was know. The, this is John Bernal. It was just a year 2000 rate that was asked for by the applicant, year not $2,000. Okay, so it was 15, what was it? 1500 1550 Thank you 15, for the 1550 Thank you for the correction. I, I'm sorry, we just called the vote. We have to reconsider that one. In okay, order to make I move to reconsider. Second. Uh, motion and second to reconsider the previous uh, vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Supervisor Brunson. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to move that uh, a, a new motion that we um, 
approve a, it's 1550, what's the 2000 rate, that we, have, that we uh, waive the impact fee or reduce the impact fee to 1550. Second, with a comment, I thought the supervisor was rounding up, but uh, 1550 <laughs> sounds reasonable to me. Motion before us is the approval of item number 23 and to waive the development fee, uh, reduce the development fee to 1550. Is that correct, uh, staff? Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those uh, opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Hearings, franchises, licenses, and permits items Mr. Chairman. through 34. Mr. Chairman, on the 11 items under franchise, license, and permits, I'd like to go ahead and close the public hearings if there's no one to speak on any of these items and move the entire 11 items from 24 through 34. Second. Motion before us is to close the public hearing and approve items 24 through 34. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving on to item or development services. Item number 35, unfinished business, code text amendment, re uh, renewable energy incentive districts read. Staff report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Chris Poirier, Development Services. Before you is a request for a text amendment to Title 14, the Renewable Energy Incentive District, otherwise called the Read of the Pima County Code. The board had previously adopted the Read in early 2012. The proposed amendment before you will correct mapping errors and provide then for the updated read maps. We will uh, be removing parcels that are within the important riparian area. We'll also be removing parcels near Manville and Sandaria Road, which were inadvertently uh, kept within the ordinance maps. Also included in the staff report is a brief update on the overall read effort. Staff has received no public comment to date. The Planning and Zoning Commission has recommended approval of the request before you. And finally, just want to put on record that we will likely see in another amendment to the read maps adding additional land to the Swan Southland specific plan under read. And that concludes staff's report. Um, Mr. Portier, that's, uh, those are the ones I was going to ask if uh, we were going to see the additions because I believe three of the, par three of the five parcels are in and two are out. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that was corrected in the future. There will be a, a correct additional mapping efforts shortly in the beginning of next year to uh, finish that out. Very well. Questions from the board? Mr. Hearing Chairman, none. is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address us on this item at this time? It is a hearing. If not, I'm going to move we close public hearing and approve the code text amendment CO8-11-06 Renewable Energy Incentive District. Second. Read. Motion and second to approve item uh, number 35. As uh, recommended by PMZ. As recommended by PMZ. And ordinance number 2013-46. And to close public hearing. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving on to item number 36, rezoning CO9-13-11, AZ Square number 7, NLC, Nogales Highway, staff report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Chris Poirier, Development Services, before you is a request to rezone approximately 0.83 acres from GR1 to CB1 for a retail use and property located on Nogales Highway south of Old Vale Connection Road. Staff has received no public comment to date on the request. Planning and Zoning Commission and staff are both recommending approval with conditions. The property is located outside the Marine Mavine Behan Conservation Land System. Uh, would like to report that there is still an outstanding issue regarding access to the site. The property owner is having trouble meeting driveway separation setbacks. They have uh, recently gone before the Subdivision Street Standards Subcommittee to uh, request a reduction. It was denied. Um, staff working with DOT does have a condition within the proposed rezoning that despite that denial, there is still potential then for ongoing uh, work with the applicant and DOT to come up with a solution. But at the end of the day, the Department of Transportation needs to approve their access location. The property is currently part of a larger property. So what was what is before you today is a portion of a larger parcel being rezoned. 
the overall parcel does currently have access. It's a named easement called Dusty Lane. Department of Transportation is recommending that the access remain at Dusty Lane. That uh, concludes staff's report and we will be available to answer questions and I imagine the applicant will, will be presenting some additional information regarding the access situation. Mr. Chairman. Uh, so where's the Miller? Um, I have a question for Mr. Poirier. Um, the information that I got said that six uh, neighbors from a neighborhood meeting actually spoke in favor of this rezoning? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor uh, Miller, um, I apologize if that's in the staff report. We'll stand, we'll stand by, but we received no protest today. Okay, so you don't, you don't have that. I, I, I got this information from my staff, and I'm not sure who they spoke to, so um, that was the information that I got was that six neighbors had spoken in favor of it, but that kind of contradicts what you reported on the um, approval of the access to the site. So um, thank you. Mr. And Chairman. So is it, Carol? Seeing that there's no further discussion or anyone no, here no, to no. address. No, no, no. Oh, is the applicant no, here? No, no, the applicant's here. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'm going to call uh, Phil Williams. Please come up. Identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chairman and Supervisors, my name is uh, Phil Williams. I'm the engineer uh, representing the interests of the Family Dollar Store today. Mm -hmm. We are excited that this area is, the county wants it to be developed commercially, and uh, we're excited to participate in that development. Uh, we do have um, a uh, major issue that we would like to be resolved with the help of the board today. Um, I don't know if uh, you have, you can see this exhibit that I brought. Mm, Mr. Williams, we table. have it displayed here and shortly it will be displayed back in on the site as well. Very good. You have the same exhibit in a letter that was given to each supervisor. Um, there are competing requirements coming in from different parts of different departments of the county on this particular project. One of the uh, requirements <laughs> was to make sure we coordinate with the CIP, the, the capital improvement project going in north of our property. Which is what? Uh, the capital improvement project involves the signalization of Nogales Highway and Old Nogales gotcha. Highway. Uh, we, uh, the DOT had their consultant, Kimley Horn uh, uh, and Associates, email us this line work that you see in blue. Um, so this line work came from uh, Kimley Horn. Um, their plan envisioned two access points, one here in line with the Tucson water parcel, and then uh, of course we've overlaid our driveway on top of their plan. Uh, we support this original layout, this preliminary plan from Kimley Horn for several reasons, um, uh, but it is a two access solution and the, the uh, Department of Transportation is in favor and supports a one access solution here at Dusty Lane. Um, the reason why we are so in support of the CIP solution, the two access solution, is number one, it gives us the required driveway spacing. Uh, in this area, the minimum safety driveway spacing is 230 feet for, for safe uh, separation between driveways. We meet that, we exceed that standard uh, between the CIP driveway and our driveway and we also exceed that standard between our driveway and the driveway to the south, the Pepe's Tire driveway. So this, uh, this solution complies with the uh, county's safety regulations as far as driveway separation goes. Um, there's a couple of elements here from the Kimley Horn plan that I'd like to point out in addition to this driveway being located here at the Tucson water parcel. They also envision a frontage road entirely in the drive in the right of way that collects local traffic from Dusty Lane and routes that traffic up to this driveway. Also, it collects local traffic from these parcels north of the driveway, also routing them down to this CIP driveway. 
we support this over the traffic department solution of moving both of these driveways to a single access point at Dusty Lane, and I'll tell you a couple of important reasons why we support the two access as opposed to the single access solution. If the driveway were reduced to one single access at the Dusty Lane easement, that would force Family Dollar customers to ingress into the site through Lot 1 and come down through Lot 1 to arrive at the Family Dollar store. And of course the Family Dollar store is a convenience store and it relies, their, their success model relies on direct access to the street, um, much like a Circle K store. Um, you'd never see a Circle K store come in and buy a lot where their customers would have to drive through another lot before they could get to the Circle K. The same, the same goes for the Family Dollar store. They, their success model, and they've built hundreds of these, relies on direct access for the convenience of their client. Also, a, a smaller point issue is that they would require a very large access easement through Lot 1, about 60 foot setback from the east property line, and that would really devalue and limit the use of Lot 1. And so it was really, this single access at Dusty Lane really has the potential to derail and kill the project. So let me, let me ask, yes. um, how, Lot 1 is not developed currently? No, that's to remain residential for now, but in the future it will be, I'm it sure, will be, be developed as commercial. So how would they, if it's developed as commercial, then how do, how are they going to get access? Well, we're proposing a shared driveway. A that shared would, driveway, uh, That it. would serve both Lot 1 and 2. Okay. And so another point is while Lot 1 is residential, it's actually against code for uh, traffic to go through a residential lot to, to get to a commercial right. lot. So we, we really don't support the single access solution. Mm -hmm. Mr. Williams, if you that. could hold on just a moment. Uh, yes. As it's my district, I, I'd like to get a clarification from transportation as to why would they're favoring the one in, uh, access entry point. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, again, the current property owner owns the two properties plus the properties that are north. And we believe it's safer and some site visibility to try to c consolidate driveways wherever we can, but to try to limit it all off a dusty lane, which is gonna serve the development both north and south right at that location. Um, it's, again, it's from um, trying to consolidate driveways instead of putting more and more driveways on our major road of um, Nogales Roadway. So that it looks pretty but doesn't function as well? That's correct. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Williams, please proceed. Yes, yeah, so um, this uh, two access solution really does save our project and, uh, and along with those tax dollars that would be generated from this project. Also, we showed this layout to the planning and zoning commissioners back in September. They agreed with this layout and approved it with the stipulation that we would also get approval from the transportation department for the two access which uh, they, they, they are still only supporting the one access solution. So we, we are really appealing to um, the Board of Supervisors to resolve our, our, our disagreement and approve this spacing as shown on this exhibit rather than the one access solution to keep our project alive and, and those uh, tax dollars coming into the county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. You're talking about development of lot one and two. Am I correct? Um, we are purchasing lot two contingent on the rezone, of course. Right. And uh, that would put us an entire lot away from Dusty Lane. We would have to, uh, you know, with that one access solution, we would be coming through lot one, which would remain a residential lot for now. Uh, to get traffic to lot two. But so you own lot, lot one and lot two are the two lots we're well, discussing here. No. These, no. these no. lots okay. are actually one single parcel right now, ready to be divided as soon as the rezone is approved. Okay, and then you have this other parcel. Lot two is, is the family dollar. Where you parcel. have the other red line, it's uh, 
No, the next one over. No, the oh, other one. Here. That. That's where you have your second entrance. Is. That's city two. Am I missing something here? Because uh, I, sh I see you have two red lines, one going into oh, here? lot one and then the other one there. Yes, this, this north driveway is actually the CIP driveway okay. in line with the Tucson Water parcel. Between Dusty Lane and Tucson Water, there's actually another parcel, the Miller parcel. And it's a, it's a flag lot. Part of it, most of the Miller parcel's up here, but a portion of it comes out to the right of way. And this dusty lane is a, actually a private uh, cross-access easement. Half of it on the Miller side, half of it on the AZ Square side. It's not a public road. It's just a okay. A so driveway. the first uh, entrance that you're proposing, you're proposing a two. Where are the two entrances that you're proposing onto these properties? Well, our entrance would be uh, serving the shared driveway between lots one and two. Okay. And then the CIP driveway what, that they'll be that they've proposed is up here at the Tucson Water Parcel, which is independent of what you're asking for today. Okay, so you you're really asking just for this one. Yes, but that but but the CIP driveway where it is located, we love that position because if it's here at the Tucson Water Parcel, that gives us our driveway, our required driveway separation, not only to the north side but also our required separation to the south. Okay, and if it and if it was accessed through Dusty Lane, you wouldn't have the proper separation, is what you're saying? No, if okay. if Dusty Lane were to remain open, then we wouldn't be able to have our driveway so close. We would have to traffic would have to come through the Dusty Lane and make its way through Lot One to Lot Two, the Family Dollar Store. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I have one more question for staff: Is this CIP uh, access? Is this already firm? Um, determined to be the access or is that something that's still in play? Mr. Chair, um, Supervisor Miller, the CIP project which we expect to go under construction in about a year or so that we're proposing to uh, the access to be at Dusty Lane but again it's, uh, it's a little bit off in the future but that's the way we would like to have it. Okay, so you're just proposing moving the CIP project? No, this is the original location of the CIP driveway. Okay, there, I think there's talks uh, after we receive this line work. I think there's been talks in between this period where they're we're talking about moving it down. Yeah, yeah, but but this is the original location. There's one more point that I'd like to show you. Perhaps you can see these findings from the P&Z Commission. Uh, these are findings where the P&Z Commission actually saw this layout and they actually struck through the language from their, uh, the transportation had a couple of conditions. And the transportation, one of the uh, 7B had a uh, recommendation from the transportation department to move our driveway north to Dusty Lane. And the PNZ Commission actually lined through that verbiage, removing that requirement from us. And in fact, in item 10 of their findings, they want us to adhere to the sketch plan as approved at the public hearing, which had our driveway down here, not at Dusty Lane. So uh, we, we agree with the, the, with the commissioners that we, we'd really like this solution. Thank you. Thank you. M Mr. Chair, uh, if I may, a um, couple points of clarification. The commission with what they did, they were okay with uh, an alternative outcome where the applicant was working with Department of Transportation. So they wordsmith the condition to allow a different outcome than everybody originally thought. It, it doesn't mean necessarily that the commission wanted this access point in one location or another. They just agreed to wordsmith the condition, not to hem them in, but again, allow the process to play out, understanding that they're likely and they would have had to go before some type of DOT approval, whether it's administrative or, or subdivision street standards. So that, that's one point. The second is, and, and it's my understanding regarding the capital improvement coordination exhibit that the, um, at the end of the day, by the end of about 2014, when the capital improvement project is completed, that DOT is intending on moving the driveway uh, from Dusty Lane north, uh, pretty much aligned then with a Tucson water parcel. 
So what the applicant is, is asking, I believe, and I'll try to do my best to summarize it, is to then be allowed to operate and, and have an access point um, today too close to Dusty Lane um, temporarily until such time that the capital improvement project is complete. At that point, it will likely meet the setback. So it, it's a, a request to expedite things and, and, and open up before the capital improvement project is complete. I hope that explains things. Okay, what I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, let me make a, a little bit of a comment and then uh, offer staff direction because uh, I, I'm leaning towards continuing this item because clearly I'm seeing one map. I'm being told that the new CIP is different. Um, I don't like the, the premise of, of pretty over practical. Uh, I prefer practical over uh, pretty, uh, clearly. Um, in terms of where I believe we need to go, I think the, the, a plan was presented here that, 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 that I like, but I'll tell you what. I think that the, considering what we're talking about in terms of the transportation needs going into the future on this particular area of, of the community and the district, what I need to see uh, is I need to have the parties work it out with transportation, and I need transportation to have a little bit more reasonable mind, uh, practical, uh, make sure that it works. I want to make sure that, that, the, that uh, one of the things that I pointed out in my own notes here was whether or not the speed limit along that road matched the separation between the driveways as well, uh, so, that the, so that we make the, uh, so we come up with a solution that is practical. So I'm going to go ahead and move to continue the item for uh, until the board meeting of December 3rd. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, all the parties involved to sit down and figure out a solution that works for everybody. So with that, I, I, that's a, a second. second. Motion and a second to continue yes, the item. Mr. Chairman, just as a point. Mr. Huckleberry, do you have any comments at this point? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think, uh, and Supervisor Bronson, I think what you could, what the issue is is the permanency of, of Dusty Lane right. and when Dusty mm -hmm. Lane will go away. That's the issue. So <clears throat> I think it's fine to have the two get together. I think what you could do is set it once they have an agreement, bring it back rather than a date on the third because that might, you know, obviously they may be under timeline about approval right. and moving forward. So if they could get a, an agreement with transportation, Tomorrow we could put it back on the agenda next week if that's acceptable right, to the board. Well, uh, I can certainly amend my own motion of saying that uh, by by December third or before, if an agreement does a secondary agree. Second. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so we continue the item to, until such time as an agreement uh, can be uh, reached or December third at the latest. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Eyes have it. Moving on to transportation items 37 through 43. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to go ahead and move items 37 through 43, including uh, resolutions 2013 102, 103, um, 52. Ordinance. Traffic ordinance, excuse me. Ordinance number uh, 2013 52, 53, 54, 55, and 56. Second. Close the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Second. Most. Thank mo you. Motion to close the public hearings and approve items 37 through 43, resolutions number 2013-102 through 103, and ordinance number 2013-52 through 56. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, on item number 36, uh, this, was a this is a public hearing item. You know, and the question is, have, have, you, have you, by that motion, basically closed the public hearing? All no, you're looking for is that other one because... No, we continued. Well, it. because then the question is, you need a date certain with regard to the public hearing, I believe, with regard to that, to this, because it is a... I believe you included that in your motion, sir. He did. Yeah, sure. I mean, he, well, he, he said, said sooner, but usually... What, 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 what he is uh, saying is, yes, yeah, the sure. deadline is certain, but he wants a date certain. What's the advertisement uh, requirement? Because otherwise, well, yeah, I mean... I mean, Chris, you remember that. We've I, done this before. Been a while. Mr. Chair, uh, Supervisors, yes. I, if it's not date certain continued, then we have an obligation to we notice have. within 15 days prior yeah. for the public hearing. Okay. So then for the public okay. hearing. But, but what I'm saying, is, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, is if, the, if you're done with the public hearing, if you're done taking testimony, there's nothing wrong with just closing the public hearing but continuing the matter to this conditional date, as you, oh. as you suggest. And that way, um, 
you know, that we, we don't have that impediment at that point. You've, okay. take, you've gotten the legislative input from the public hearing. You've satisfied the requirement of the law at that point. Mm. All so right. Move, okay. to move to reconsider item number 36. Second. Motion a second to uh, move to reconsider. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. I move that we close the public hearing and continue the matter of item 36 CO9-13-11 uh, until at the latest December 3rd or at which time or whatever time the, an agreement can be reached. Second. Second. Council, is that correct? Uh, yes. Does that work? Thank you. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. <sighs> now on to addendum item two. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the item. <laughs> second. second. Um, motion and a second to approve item number two under the Flood Control District Board on the addendum agenda. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And then I, I'm assuming we're doing this because it's flood control. We had to hear it involved. Got it. Correct. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please signify. Oh, you always say aye. All those opposed, signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Moving on to item number three. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the item. Second. second. Motion a second to approve item number three. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Um, Chair, I entertain a motion to approve item number five, six, eight, and nine. So moved. Motion and a second to approve item five, six, eight, and nine on the addendum agenda. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, on this item or? On number nine, sir, I'd just like to give a great shout out and thank you to Chairman Ned Norris and the Tohono O'odham Nation. Uh, not just because a great deal of this money will be shared with, uh, Green Valley. with the Green Valley area. <laughs> but also Casa de los Niños and all the body armor vests and all the other great things that they're doing each and every year with the money. It's not law. It's, uh, it's a grant and a gift to our community from their original inhabitants. And thank you very much to Ned Norris and the Tohono O'odham Nation. God bless them in the work. Indeed, thank you. Now we move to call to the public. Uh, and uh, let me start with Jerry Orobani. Please identify your, uh, just by name. For the record, you have three minutes. Uh, Chairman and Board of Supervisors, my name is Jerry Ataboni and I live in Oro Valley. And um, a few Sundays ago on the 27th of October, our church had a visiting pastor from uh, Minnesota and I thought he had an interesting observation of Tucson and our county. He was discussing the Reformation and now keep in mind, he's speaking to a th over a thousand people from the Tucson, Pima County area. He said, in heaven the streets are paved with gold, but you here in Arizona would be happy to have streets paved with anything. So I'm including the disc. <laughs> and keep in mind, he's from Minnesota. <laughs> and it's on track number eight. Thank you, Jerry. Next, I'm going to go ahead and call on Mary Murphy. Please come up, identify yourself for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, everybody. Hello, four. Here I am again. Three minutes, never enough. But I have to apologize for being an old fashioned girl with very old fashioned technology. And the glitch on my tape of my last presentation just was. I didn't know what to make of it. Uh, given that some of what I'm running into in Green Valley has so much to do with things to do with, <clears throat> excuse me, First Amendment rights. I mean, I've been libeled, slandered, defamed, everything, my homeowners association, Green Valley Council, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my aunt, Marge, she was the trailblazer from Chicago, out here first in the late 50s, and she fell in love with it out here. Uh, she lived in Tucson before she got turned on to Green Valley. That was in the 1963, the end of 63, the town was beginning to be populated. And uh, anyways, my home is the only family-owned home that goes back to the beginning of Green Valley. My first visit to Nogales, they had a bull ring. Uh, I bet on the Greyhounds on the side at the Tubac Park. And anyways, 
this is what's become of my home. It has been trashed, vandalized. Talk about hateful neighbors. My aunt's heaven on earth is now with the neighbors from hell. And I, um, everybody can have a copy of this because this is the way it's staying until all issues with my homeowners association, with the Green Valley Council, with Pima County are resolved because everybody's been in on this. So Robin, can I leave this with you? I was gonna do historical family status for this house. It's the only one. Anyway, like I said once before, I was sitting in my father's chair when I watched the drainage way fail behind my house. This back and forth with flood control and the history of Green Valley the Corps of Engineers, I mean, God help us. Uh, Green Valley is without flood control. The Army Corps of Engineers, it starts with a reconnaissance. What do we have to do to get that? And it's not a local drainage issue. We have 27 drainage ways all headed for that river. They're all sentimented over. Uh, there's problems with culverts. There's problems with public drainage easement. There are road issues. There are traffic problems. It's too far gone for too far long. It's, we gotta do something about it and I'm here if I have to, you know, beg. I have no pride left, look what they've done to my home. This needs to be looked at because more needs to be done there in that town. Uh, we need redevelopment, we need, uh, we need a grocery store in my old neighborhood. People wanna work, you don't hear Green Valley needs jobs. My parents moved out here when they were 60. My mother worked until she was 72. Now bring on the baby boomers with all their credit card debt, and we need help. Let's start with the Corps of Engineers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Next, I'd like to call on Sarah Dent. Please come up, identify yourself for the record, and you have three minutes. Chairman and Supervisors, my name is Sarah Dent. I live here in Pima County. Um, Thank you for passing the addendum number four with regards to expanding the space at PAC that's so desperately needed. I had no intentions of speaking to you all today until you brought up something in the general discussion uh, considering a mandatory spay neuter as part of the solution. And I'm here to tell you that it absolutely does not succeed when you try to do mandatory spay neuter for the goal of reducing the number of animals that end up at animal shelters. Um, many, if not all, of the communities around the country that have tried or attempted mandatory have only increased the numbers of intake at their shelters, and the reasons for this are many. One of them is because you have owner relinquishment because they can't afford to comply with something that's mandatory, excuse me, um, or they get cited and fined and then they can't afford to pay the fines or fees, and so then that makes them in violation, and rather than paying the fines and fees, they end up relinquishing their animals at the animal control. Then you also have, if you make something mandatory, then you need to enforce it. So then you're gonna need to have more resources to have officers on the street to actually enforce this and be able to cite people in order to make people in compliance. The problem with spay and neuter in our community and in every community in our country is a lack of resources and a lack of access to that spay and neuter um, options. It's not an aversion to the concept of spay and neuter. Um, OWASA here in Southern Arizona is a, it's a wonderful program in theory, but in practice, there's just not enough money there to fund it. Sometimes people have to wait up to nine months to get their animals spayed or neutered because the waiting list is first come, first serve for a voucher program. OWASA identifies lower income neighborhoods as being the ones that are most important to serve, and it's not an accident that they do that. It's because of that lack of resources, which includes not only a lack of knowledge of the benefits of spay and neutering your animals, which include health, longevity for your animals, includes behavioral issues that can be resolved, and a reduction in litters and unwanted babies that they need to figure out what to do with. You have a lack of affordable veterinary clinics in these areas. You have a lack of availability of transportation to get to where clinics are available for people um, for the limited resources that are available out there for people that are looking for it. You're always gonna have a small percentage of your community that doesn't want to comply, but if you have everyone else being able to because you have free and accessible spay and neuter, the shelters can handle that small percentage of people that are not gonna comply with the spay and neuter. 
You also talked about options for paying for it. One, voluntarily incorporating the communities around to uh, contribute money. That's a great idea. Um, I liked the idea the best of incorporating it into the budget because if you rely on compliance with licensing fees, you're gonna go back to the same issues. As a former city prosecutor, I'm an attorney here in town and I teach animal law at the University of Arizona. Um, I can tell you that the compliance with licensing for Pima County is very low because we have a lot of violators. And so if you base such an important program as spay neuter on people complying with licensing fees, you're never gonna get anywhere and you're gonna end up back in the same problem. Um, I would be more than happy to email all of you with all this information plus more about the success <coughs> or lack thereof in the nation for every community that's tried to be a notorious bay manager. I would be more than happy to do that. So thank you for your time. I realize that I've gone over, but thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who, here who would like to address the board that calls the public? Folks, we do have one more. I'm going to ask you to fill out a green card at uh, the end of the time. Well, I was, seven, I was the person who was going to speak at 17. I am 17, Mia Hansen. Okay, we, ha we have your card. Okay, just briefly, Mia Hansen. I'm the co-founder of the Festival and Events Association of Tucson and Southern Arizona, and I really just wanted to thank you for your support of El Tour de Tucson, Tucson Meet Yourself, and other really important community events. And I wanted to make you aware of FEATS AZ. We're a fairly new association that really um, is including all of our wonderful long-time events like El Tour de Tucson, Richard de Bernardis is on our board of directors, um, as well as new events and events who maybe aren't as well established or haven't had the opportunity to have the benefit of someone as skilled as Richard is at getting sponsorships. Um, you mentioned in your comments about losing a sponsor being an important element in your funding this event. They're a nonprofit organization and a wonderful and very um, deserving one, as are many other nonprofit organizations that do put on great community events that not only bring in tourists from outside that spend outside dollars, but also create benefit for our community. So I just ask you to consider maybe going forward, growing the pot of money that you have allocated um, in your regular line items, also in your contingency budget, um, towards supporting festivals and events. Um, and maybe having a process by which other festivals and events can apply for um, that pot of money. Uh, City of Tucson also has a, a very small amount of money in their budget. It's basically $130,000 out of a $1.2 billion budget that's dedicated towards festivals and events. That's a minuscule amount compared to the amount of benefit that we receive in our community of these wonderful, vibrant festivals and events. And I recently came back from the IFEA, the International Festival and Events Convention in Pittsburgh, where I met with uh, the, the people who are in charge of the, uh, the Indianapolis 500, the Kentucky Derby Festival, and they recognized that Tucson and Pima County is an amazing um, place for festivals and events, but we aren't quite talking um, with the same voice. That's why Feeds AZ is formed. Uh, we've only been around for a couple of years now, but we're really excited about the energy that we've got. Um, we want to thank you know, all of you who have been taking our meetings, and we'd like to meet with you further, maybe with staff, to help you come up with other ways that you can continue to support this vibrant industry. So thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board of the call to the public? Hearing none, this meeting stands adjourned.